Did I win? Did I win, guys? <laughs> Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. And I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And you are not in the studio. Ian, where are you? I'm out in uh, some town in uh, Kansas off of Interstate 70. Not sure what the town is, but gas is $1.94. I just put in like almost, I think I spent like 48 bucks on gas, which is probably the, the least amount I've spent in a solid 10 to 15 years. Wow. So, where, yeah. where are you uh where where are you headed i'm headed to i th- i think i'm pronouncing it right uh wyanoka oklahoma for utv takeover event as as hard it is for me to say Conconoli on the on the on the whim i think that place has been pronunciated a hundred different ways that i've heard this week it's a mouthful for yeah. sure yeah so uh utv takeover what are you guys what are you guys doing out there uh we're gonna be on vendor row and then going to be doing a little bit of ripping i know that the the rev media crew is going to be out there i've already talked to them a couple times today they're going to get us involved in i, I think they're going to get us involved in the show that they're filming i don't know if they're filming gears rocks or if they're filming sh- filming shreddy life i think they're filming shreddy life so that would be cool we'll, i think wilkie was on the road uh, heading out that way this uh, this week yeah brian said he was in amarillo a little earlier so he's probably going to beat me there i think i'm still about three hours out gotcha well, that should be a good time. By the time this podcast comes out, uh, the event will be over and uh, in the books. So, um, but if you happen to have ran into him, um, say hi and, and make sure that uh, you give him a, a fist bump on the on the way through Vendor Row. For sure. Well, this episode of the podcast is going to be uh, a little different than a normal. Uh, the last few months, we've been talking about BDR trips and off roading, um, and uh, this week we got a special guest uh, from. Uh, Arizona, and he is uh, a longtime moto racer uh, turned UTV racer. Uh, he's had a number of uh, hurdles in his career, and we're going to talk about those a little bit more. Uh, but he's also uh, venturing on a new project here uh, in the next couple weeks that we're going to highlight and, and get a little deeper into. Uh, but uh, welcome to the podcast, George Hamill of The Dirt Life Show. Thanks for having me, boys. I really appreciate it. It's awesome to talk uh, all of our dirt lives together, right? For sure. It's a it's a great adventure that we all g- jump into once we get into these uh, machines, and we all have a different experience, and we definitely are interested into hearing about what uh, what transpired across your career here. So tell us a little bit about you and, and where you're from and um, kind of just the basic foundation of who you are, and then we'll, we'll start diving in. Sounds good. Well, uh, yeah, so like Zach said, my name is George Hamill. Everybody calls me Georgie. I'm actually George Frederick Hamill VI, so when we go to family reunion, it's pretty gnarly. But uh, I grew up in uh, southern Arizona, and uh, most of my life just kind of grew up in the dirt, just like all of us, uh, dirt, dirt bikes and stuff like that. But when I, uh, uh, I don't know, I was about 19, I think, I moved to Southern California, lived there for about 10 years, and uh, we can go into all the details of that, and then Got in the saw my first side by side, and uh, the rest was kind of history from there. Yeah, and you are the host of the Dirt Life Show, a podcast uh, that was started roughly around the same time we started our podcast. We started last fall. Uh, you started, I think, a little earlier this year, right? Um, and uh, have, have... we started in August of 2019. Okay, great. So you you started two months before we did. So that's awesome. Um, so it, I've I've watched your show and all your interviews, and and we've. Um, you know, it's, it's been basically time coming for this to happen and eventually, uh, cross ways and, and get you, get each other on the show. So, um, let's, let's dive in a little bit. Let's talk, um, a little bit about your, your career. Uh, you were a professional motocross racer racing two wheels. Um, how did that progress? How did that start? And, um, kind of what happened there? So I think like, like most of us, we just kind of grew up, uh, around living in the dirt. Like where I grew up in Southern Arizona, we didn't even have paved roads, so we were literally living our dirt life every single day. So when we would walk to the bus stop, it would take, you know, two to three miles of just walking in the dirt before we got to the bus stop. So um, my parents had, uh, you know, quads and ATVs and stuff like that. And we basically just went to the dunes and stuff, but uh, never really raced or anything. So finally, um, when I one day, just a kid came over with the dirt bike. I think I was around 12 years old. So it was kind of a late bloomer, but a kid came over with the dirt bike and I was like, Oh my God, that thing's the coolest thing ever. Like I need one. Like, and so I begged my dad, you know, for God knows how long. And then one day he just uh, saved us money working as a mechanic. And he, uh, 
came home with one in his truck, man. This little uh, CR60. Nice. My boy uh, has a KTM 50 and he's quickly outgrown it. So we're, we're on the hunt for the next evolution of what that's going to look like. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I love to see all those kids come out and do that. Even with the Razor 170s, we can talk about that stuff. But the, uh, it's just so cool to see all this stuff. And uh, yeah, so going on the next step for me, like I just started riding and having some fun and, you know, having fun with buddies and things like that. And I had a a next door neighbor that uh, lived next to me and he was into dirt bikes as well. He's a couple years older than me. His name's Casey Peck and he actually hosts the Dirt Life show with me. And uh, he was always like, I, you look up to, right? Like you're the, you're the slower guy and you got a faster guy. And so he kind of taught me a lot of the stuff that we did. And we had three or four guys that rode dirt bikes around us and I progressed pretty quickly. And it was awesome because over the span of, if I was 12 years old and when I was, just turning 18, I was turning pro. So six years it took me to turn pro. So it was uh, very accelerated. And, you know, now looking back on it, I can kind of pat myself on the back and, and be thankful that I was able to do it so quickly because it takes a, a lot to race, you know, professional motocross or any professional sport. And I was really lucky that I was uh, had the skill set and was talented enough to be able to go as fast as I did in such a short amount of time. So like I said, looking back on it, it's nice, nice to be able to pat myself on the back for it. But uh, man, the tables turned pretty quick when I turned pro. So how many races did you have mm-hmm. under your belt before you were uh, on to the next step that we're going to get to? How, like, how long did it take to trans- transition from amateur to pro and then when you hit that wall? Um, I did a bunch of amateur racing, I guess. I did, well, I raced locally, I think, probably the first four years and then, like, maybe the fifth year or so, like, five to seven-year range is when I kind of started taking it serious, like, wow, this could actually work out. Um, we were riding uh, a Suzuki 8 at the time, and Suzuki had the best contingency program. So without getting too far into that, we would make a lot of money uh, through those contingency programs. So I would go on an 80 to a local event or some sort of semi-regional event or whatever it was, and I would clean house. I'd race the 80 expert class. I would race the 125 intermediate class, and sometimes I would race the pro class all on the same bike on a, on a R Suzuki 80. So I'd come home with like 2,500 bucks a weekend. So I'm like 15, 16 years old, making like 10 grand a month in contingency. So it was fantastic. Like that's how we paid for the whole program. And so that gave us the ability to understand, um, well, maybe I could do this as a profession. Um, I still worked with my dad. He was working as a mechanic and had an auto shop and stuff. So I would go and, you know, summertime and work on cars and things like that. So try to get your mechanical ability and work ethic up, you know. Um, But uh, it was cool because then I was like, okay, well, I'll start putting some effort in this. I started training, started, you know, bicycle riding, working out, doing the things that you would do to be a professional athlete. And uh, a couple of years later, I was able to turn pro. So when you went pro, like, what's the transition like? Is there an actual thing that you're doing that says you're now pro? Is there a sponsorship level? Is it what's what's actually saying the difference between a guy on his bike on the weekend and the guy that's saying he's a pro? I think back then I was pretty naive and I didn't understand what the difference was. Nowadays, it's a lot different because you actually have to go through um, certain steps to be able to do that. But I kind of just said, okay, I'm ready to turn pro. I'm fast enough. I'm beating all these guys on a lesser lesser equipment, and these guys are already in the pro class, so I'm going to do it too. And uh, we went and got our AMA pro license, which is the American Motorcycle Association, and uh, just signed up for a Supercross race and talked with other pros that were out there that were uh, friendly guys that wanted to you know, help out and take the races and stuff like that and just kind of <laughs> went for it, basically. Ian, I know you did a lot of growing up on two wheels. Uh, did you ever participate in any kind of racing programs? No, back I, I didn't get I didn't throw my leg over a bike until I was a little bit older. But I, I grew up on BMX. I was on a uh, Southwest Washington where I grew up. Had a little bit of a BMX circuit, and I would participate in that. And that's kind of where where my background came from. But it is kind of cool to hear hear some stories about guys like Kevin Windham, guys like Jeremy McGrath too. Their background quite a bit. They they spent a lot of time on BMX as well. So George, I know that you're uh, currently. Uh, pretty involved in in bicycle riding uh like actual on the road um was there any kind of history back then with bmx like ian saying or with any kind of programs like that dude 100 percent. yeah we have so many stories of bmx stuff so like i said we grew up and there wasn't paved roads so the only way we got around was we walked or we rode bicycles so um all the dirt roads around us we had uh little side areas like uh 
alleyways with big jumps in them, like all kinds of fun stuff, man. So if we weren't uh, actually riding our bikes, we were building stuff to make jumps and, and have a good time with them. So, yeah, I mean, like literally, like that's the reason we have the show called The Dirt Life is because that is what branded us at, as human beings is just living in the dirt and making things out of dirt. Yeah, it's definitely an awesome feeling to be able to take something that you enjoy, like bike riding, and then ex- and then push it to the next level and, and feel that that acceleration of uh, adrenaline and all that stuff that comes along with it. And I think that's something that helps drive us in our sports, where it be moto, whether it be UTVs, whether it be auto racing or whatever. Is it's taking that that core concept and always pushing the envelope with it, changing the capability and changing the progression. Uh, something that I definitely enjoyed entering the UTV market myself and then, and then expanding my skill set and then the, the hardware and, and things like that. So, um, you were pushing the, the two wheels pretty good. And then your career was going uh, forward. You were winning races. Um, how, how, what was life like at that point and how did it change? Yeah. Well, and being a 19 year looking back on it is the hindsight's 2020, 20, right? Like being a 19 year old, like you think you're the coolest shit on the planet, right? You're like, going fast on a dirt bike, girls like you, you don't, you don't have to really think about getting a job, like you're making good money, like you, you think you're cool, right? So, but the, the, the world around you is not the same as what you actually think and what's going on in real life, right? So um, it was uh, my first, I had already done a couple of super crosses and we had done decent at them. We had, you know, changed the world or anything like that, but I was learning and I was having a good time and we would going to our first, outdoor national and uh it was at glen helen and i got a really really big reality check because it was like getting on the track with rocket ships right these guys are going so fast so i was racing against like kind of just what ian said the same uh caliber of riders that he was talking about um the guys that i grew up riding against were ricky carmichael and uh nick way and guys like that and uh, in fact, one of the claims to fame that I have is in Las Vegas at the World Mini Grand Prix when I was an amateur. Um, Ricky smoked us, but uh, I ended up getting second in the in the ADF for a class, and he was the guy that got first. So, uh, but he was probably half a lap ahead of us. So <laughs> it wasn't even close. Different yeah. league, uh, right? But it, it's cool that I can say that, right? Like I, I can rest my rest my head on that. Um, but uh, yeah, so we grew up racing against those guys, and I went to my first national on Glen Helen, and we basically just got out on the track and I was like, all right, man, I'm just going to have to give it full pepper this time. Like I, I don't have a choice. Like I got to go for it. And, uh, so I was out there and I was doing really good. Uh, it was the first practice session and, uh, my suspension wasn't that great, but it was decent. Like I didn't know any better. I didn't know I had really good suspension. So I just went and gave it my all. And, uh, I was following around a guy named Jimmy Button. And uh, Ian probably knows who he is, but he was actually on a factory Yamaha team with, uh, I think it was Jeremy McGrath. Button McCracken. fly. Huh? Button fly. Yep. And uh, so it's funny how things come full circle because Jimmy actually uh, owns a, uh, a company called Road to Recovery now, and he's a, an agent for motocross guys, and uh, he broke his back as well. But so to go on with that, I thought I was doing really well. I was like, man, I'm following Jimmy Button around. Like, this is this is great. Like, I've never gone this fast in my life and I feel comfortable going this pace. Like, I think I'm going to really do good at this outdoor national stuff. Like supercross was difficult for me because I didn't have any training on it. I just kind of went for it. And this outdoor stuff felt like it was up right up my alley. Um, but, uh, at Glen Helen, if you guys know that track, it's got a, a huge hill. It's one of the biggest hills on the national circuit and it's called Mount St. Helens. I was coming down that hill and at the bottom of the hill, you're roughly fourth gear wide open on a 125, uh, which is going pretty fast. And there's big braking bumps and uh, you have to stop and go into a corner on this specific track. And right before that is like a little jump that you would scrub um, and kind of just lose all your speed before you go into the rut or the berm. And I got kicked off the back of the bike when I was following Jimmy down the hill. And what it did was it kind of gave me, um, a whiskey throttle. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but you kind of get pulled off the back of the bike like you're riding a bull and it get, makes it so that you give it full throttle. And unfortunately at that point, you don't have any control because your body and your momentum is off the back of the bike. 
and going up to that next like scrub jump to go into a corner you would shift down from fourth into third and second and and, and slow down but i hit that scrub jump going fourth gear wide open as fast as the bike would go and it basically just uh catapulted me off the back of the bike and uh, disconnected me from the bike uh and i was flying through the air they call it rolling up the windows because i had my arms like flapping in the air like trying to fly through the air and uh they said it was the about the equivalent of uh jumping out of a six-story building and landing on your feet wow so i flew through the air and i flew over um a portion of the track and uh flew over some spectators and flaggers and stuff I don't know how far the distance I flew was, but it was a very, very long distance because you're going so fast. And I landed up landing on my feet. I broke both my ankles, um, my tailbone. I fractured uh, L1 in my back and burst it. Uh, that gave me a spinal cord injury. I broke my arms and fractured a little piece of my skull when I landed. Uh, so it was, it was pretty difficult. And I could go into all of the uh, negative stuff. Like, you know, when I was standing or, you know, trying to get off the track, my legs were like, sandbags and I couldn't feel myself and things like that but I'd rather talk about the positive stuff because like I said it was a reality check and it showed me that I needed to uh, have a different life and understand how I was going to do stuff without motocross anymore and without the dirt life so to speak so whew, man even going through it it kind of gets me a little bit uh gets me going a little bit but uh yeah it was a difficult time man I was in the hospital for months at a time and Shoot, I had just under five years, I think, in a wheelchair. I couldn't even walk, and I had to go to school and figure out everything that was going on. Like, when I was sitting in the hospital bed, man, my parents came in, and I was 19 at the time, and I was thinking, like, they're like, well, what are you going to do now? Like, you, your job's done, right? And I was thinking to myself, like, well, shit, like, I don't know. The only thing I know is two wheels. I only know handlebars. So maybe I could start a bicycle shop. Maybe I could, you know, do something like that. But they're like, dude, you're tripping. Like, you, you can't do that. Like, you can't move your body. Like, it's your, your toast, right? Like, but I wasn't thinking like that. I was pretty naive at the time. And one thing that I went through uh, was talking to them. The doctor came in and he, he looked at me and he said, you know, I asked him, I said, am I going to be able to walk again? He said, no, I think you need to... Uh, get used to living your life in a wheelchair. And I just looked at him and I just, I don't know if I can cuss on the show, but I said, fuck you. And he left. And that was the last time I saw him. Gotcha. I never ever saw that doctor again after that point. So I had uh, got transported back to Arizona and started just getting, doing rehab and getting better. And uh, I had many conversations with my family about what I was going to do next. And we started talking about me getting into computers and getting an education and going to school. And I didn't really want to do it. Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm getting long winded, but I didn't really want to do it. I thought that computers were dumb, right? Dirt bike guy. I don't want to do computers. I don't want to sit down. Like I need to be outdoors doing stuff, but it ended up being what I wanted, what I ended up having to do. So I went and got, uh, we couldn't afford it to just give, send me to college. So I went and got uh, government grants and things like that to be able to go to college. And I ended up getting my college paid for. And uh, I got a computer science degree. Um, I hated school so much that I just went for roughly eight to 10 hours a day for every single day, weekends, summer, every single day. And I graduated in two and a half years. Uh, because I hated school so much. I just wanted to get through it. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a huge turning point in my life. And that whole time I was doing rehab and trying to get, you know, my legs working and planning on where I was going to work and just life, life in general. Like it was just crazy. So up to and, that point, what, uh, kind of limitations were you dealing with? I mean, you're saying you're in a wheelchair, uh, but people are saying you can't move. Like what kind of mobility did you have at that point? Uh, I had very limited mobility. So unfortunately, I was just working as hard as I could to get as much mobility with my legs as possible. Like I could move my arms because they had ended up healing. Like when you break a bone, it takes, you know, six to eight weeks to, for a bone to heal. Um, so the bones were okay. Like my legs were that were broken and my knees and my arms and stuff, they healed. But when you get a spinal cord injury, um, the nerves, they can't heal like that. It just doesn't happen. And 
every single spinal cord injury is different. Nobody ever comes out the same. And luckily during some of the therapies that I did and some of the rehab that I did, I started getting a little bit of movement back in, uh, in some of the limbs that I had. So I could start moving my quadricep muscles a little bit. And during that uh, five year period, my quadriceps started getting to the point where I could actually move around a little bit and walk. So that to me was like a whole new level of, of excitement, right? Cause I don't have to sit in this stupid ass wheelchair anymore. Right. And uh, if you were talking to my mom, she was like, she started crying one day because I came home from therapy and I was in my wheelchair and I walked up to her and I uh, rolled up to the kitchen counter and I put my arms on the kitchen counter and I lifted myself up and I like barely, like I took my hands off the countertop to like see how strong my legs were at the time for like, it was probably like half a second or a second, but it felt like an eternity for me. Right. And she looked over and she was like crying. And I was like, yes, this is the next step. Like I have to keep going with this because this, this changes everything. This is like a new light. I got to go after it. So that was a huge moment for me because man, I'm kind of getting teared up. No, it, it shows, it shows that anything is possible. It doesn't matter what happens to you. You can really, really do better at life. And just seeing her, like, she was crying tears of joy. It was like, holy crap, I can't believe you did that. So it was like next level for me. That changed my life to, to be what it is today. It's amazing how often we get told no in things. And we, we get told that we need to, you know, accept certain scenarios um, whether that be in just day-to-day -day family life or, uh, racing or, um, you know, just different aspects of, of daily life. Right. And, um, what's amazing is nine times out of 10, those assumptions are wrong. Like the, the assumption that it can't happen or it can't be, or it can't do, uh, nine times out of 10 are just other people's limited scope, their limited perspective. And when we adopt a new perspective and we adopt a new hope, it's amazing what we can do. Yeah, that's, that's 100%. I actually live by a quote. I don't know what the quote is uh, exactly, but it's by a guy named William Blake. And if he says, if the eyes of perception were cleared, everything would seem as it really is infinite. And that's what I live by. If somebody tells me one thing, I think, okay, well, either how can you do it that way, or I can do it better, or no, I'm not going to listen to you because it still is possible. And that's the way I live every single day. I mean, going through all that stuff when I got a spinal cord injury, I didn't know any better, right? I was naive. I was just a stupid-ass dirt bike racer that thought it was cool. But my parents were so uh, supportive at the time. I would go through punching bags. I was so frustrated. They would buy literal punching bags and I would go through them in like a month because I would hit them so much. And so there was so many different things that led up to me being able to just push myself up on the countertop that showed this is what humans do. And this is what humans can achieve. If they use all of that energy to focus on getting better in a positive way and not be uh, so negative all the time. Yeah, for sure. There's, there's an amazing ability uh, to overcome. And when we can, uh, when we start getting a taste of that, uh, you know, it spurs another piece of adrenaline in us. It's a different kind of adrenaline, but our, our, our mind and our, and our soul kind of adapts to that. And we start adopting that new philosophy of change and that new philosophy of overcoming. And so you took that and you were able to, um, you know, get through the rehab and get to a point where you were starting to build a new a new life around that, right? You started getting your education, you got a job in the field, you started moving forward. Um, and then like at some point you're saying um, the addiction to the to the outdoors and the dirt and the two wheels is, is too great. I got to get back into this. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so I'll try to make a long story short, but um, after I graduated, um, I waited probably six months or a year and I ended up moving to Southern California. And uh, when I moved out there, it was a little, actually, it was a little difficult for me to find a job. And uh, I couldn't just get like, I don't know, I couldn't get my head wrapped around just going to work with, uh, um, and I, I don't mean this because you do IT stuff too, but you'll get it. The The typical computer guy is a guy with glasses and a polo shirt and, and uh, khakis, right? Well, I can't wrap my head around that because I don't get along with those people. Like my mentality doesn't 
go the same way as them. I, I got to talk about dirt. I got to be doing stuff like that. Like I'm too hyper and I'm too intense to be able to, to be able to be in those situations. So I looked for a computer job that was satisfying to me. And I found one at a company called Spy Optic. They make sunglasses and goggles and stuff like that. And um, I ended up being their uh, network administrator. And uh, they hired me on part time the first week. I worked uh, sixty hours, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. it was like I was like, okay, good. I'm 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 good at my job, and I know that I can fit in here. So it was a a good thing to have, right? So Ian, Ian, what was that you were holding up there, bud? My spy glasses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got some spy glasses? Of course, dude. That's what McGrath used to rock. That's all I used to rock when I was younger, for sure. It sounds like somebody on this call likes McGrath. Dude, my boy's name is Miles Casey. You, me- you remember what McGrath's nickname was? Well, you know, like the other racers called him MC. And so I I named my boy Miles Casey kind of as a tribute to him. Like he was, he was oh, right on. yeah, dude, he, he was, he was one of my heroes. I mean, your story there is just absolutely remarkable. I'm also dating you a little bit when you're talking about battling with, with button. I mean, we're talking what 96, 97, somewhere in there. I got hurt in 98. Yeah. Dude, that is such a unique time for moto too, because that's kind of, that's kind of the tail end of the party days, like the Ronald Sheen type days. And like right it was, it was when things started getting yeah, serious. It's it's where uh, it's where guys like Larocco and and Carmichael just went nuts and almost took it to like a Lance Armstrong type level. It was just a very a really unique time in moto. You know where the the guys that were just super naturally talented and stuff had to had to put in the work to keep up with because Carmichael would be the first guy to tell you he wasn't the fastest guy out there. He wasn't the he wasn't the most naturally gifted guy, but he became the fastest guy because he just grinded. You know, he's just such a workhorse. But, yeah, and that's that's kind of the way that I I learned how to rehab is because I started being a professional around that same time. So I started seeing what I had to do to keep up with these guys, and then so I got hurt, and I was like, shit, I need to keep this going because I need to beat life now. Yeah, and, and let me let me re uh, let me rephrase what I just said about Carmichael maybe not being the fastest. Carmichael was nuts. Like like I would watch that guy's you know on one twenty fives and stuff where I'm like he's gonna die. Like this yeah. is insane. I'm like, this is insane. Like this guy, this guy basically was just. It, it looked like he was just wide open the the entire time. This dude, this is such an amazing. I'm so pumped you're on, man. It's such an amazing story. Like that's that's when I went moto crazy. Was right around that time, and I was paying attention to it so much. I was like right out of high school. This, this is imagine this is, being on the track with Carmichael when he was wide open. <laughs> I, I can't. I, I can't even imagine for sure. And there was some there was some motos when he fell down like early in the race and we were ahead of him and like it was almost scary to know because it was like oh shit he's coming like there's no way that you're gonna stop this dude because he's gonna rip past you like a bullet and, and those it's almost like those days are over a little bit like you see some of the fastest guys like everybody's fast now yeah everybody's fast there was a huge difference in the speed between us and him. And for everybody listening, uh, if you're wondering why I'm being quiet, it's because I have no experience in the motocross world. So, Ian, I'm leaning on you on this one. Yeah, no, this is this is pumping me up for sure. <laughs> so uh, you were saying that this uh, watching some of these pro athletes really got you kind of in the mindset of recovering. Um, you know, how did how did that move you forward, and, and what happened next? Well, I, yeah, and uh, how do I say this? Like, I don't want to. I don't want to say that I leaned on other people because I, I did it mostly myself, right? I had good support mechanisms, but I had to work my ass off. Like we're talking about it uh, as it was a, just an easy thing. Right. But I mean, this is years and years. I mean, by the time I was seven years deep, it was, I was barely walking around without crutches at the time. So I, I had to take all these steps to do it. Like when I first started walking, I had these big old leg braces on, they were super heavy i had to walk with like uh they're called forearm crutches they're like what the guys with polio and stuff walk and um those were way more of a pain in the ass than driving the wheelchair around like so it's it's all of these things they teach you so much because they teach you patience they think they teach you how to be a stronger person they they teach you uh about situations around you if a guy's an asshole at the store and he doesn't want to open a door or he or he just like cuts you off or people in the grocery store like they teach you all of these different things because now you know 
what your surroundings are like nobody's business because you have to be aware of everything going on around you and what you need to do to progress to move forward with life surrounding you so much. Yeah, I've been really inspired by uh, stories like yours and like um, watching like Tanner Godfrey and his situation with his wreck and everything. Uh, there's been a lot of um, really interesting lessons learned through those processes that even as an observer on the outside, uh, we can benefit from like just knowing how to be uh, uh, have a different perspective and how to, how to be grateful and patient for things is a big part of life. And um, looking at people on this new medium called social media, you know, we can really actually if we want to take the time to uh, to absorb some of these things, we can actually learn a lot of these lessons without having to go through them the hard way. Yeah. And that's one of the things I was going to say is that social media has done well, a lot of damage, but it's done so many positive things by sharing stories. Like, like you said, like Tanner, Tanner's an awesome dude. And uh, there's just so many people that have had amazing stories like that. I mean, I watched two this morning, two 20 minute videos this morning. Um, as I was driving down the road, I'll, I'll preface that I didn't watch them. I listened to them, but they were both based on the same thing saying how amazing these people are to be doing these things. And I'm not going to get into specifics, but a bunch of people have asked me, who's your favorite person? Like, who do you look up to? Who's your favorite athlete? And my answer is always whoever is trying the hardest at life. So it could be somebody that's totally off the wall. It could be just a support mechanism that I just received a couple of weeks ago or something like it's amazing to see what humans are capable of. Yeah, I got to admit, one of my favorite follows on social media is Jesse Nelson. Like, you want to talk about a dude that I'm pulling for that? I mean, he's just killing. <laughs> yeah, he's a good dude. I was uh, at his house uh, a couple weeks ago just hanging out. And uh, it's neat to be able to talk with him because he's so like-minded. He really loves uh, being in the dirt and doing side-by-side -side stuff. I think he really wants uh, – because he's, he's a pretty fresh uh, injury. Um, so – I think he really wants to have that same moto mindset and still do the moto stuff. But at some point uh, that stuff's going to, you know, fall by the wayside and he's going to be fully into the off road stuff. So it's pretty cool to see him make the transition right now because he's going back and forth. Yeah. I've seen some, uh, I've seen some clips they've put out of him, you know, like some, some productions and he can rip no doubt about it. It's pretty sweet to see him out there. We went to a works race and helped him uh, in Havasu at the beginning of this year. And when we went there, you, I went there. I've never been to a works race until I went to that one. And when we saw other guys driving on the track, it looked like they were just pounding their razors, like hurting them, just going as fast as they could, right? Like a normal desert guy does. And then you see a guy like Jesse go out there who can't move his legs, but he can still use his brain the way that he did at the professional motocross level. I mean, he won a Supercross in Anaheim. I mean, right. So the skill level that he still has that he possesses is amazing. I would watch him go into corners and do things in a razor, like double over braking bumps, and then like make it look so much smoother than every other driver on the course. It was phenomenal. I told him first time after I saw him drive the track, I came back to the truck and I go, dude, this is insane. Once you get your program done, you're going to be smoking everybody because your driving ability is so much higher. It's insane. Like, I can't wait to see what you're capable of. And he goes, dude, I'm into it. I just got to get the program done. It's just it's such an unfortunate reality, just the gnarly nature of moto. You know, I mean, we were just talking about McGrath. I mean, one of the guys that McGrath dubbed as the second coming of Jeremy McGrath was Ernesto Fonseca. And, you know, yep. he got taken out you know, way earlier, he had, a, had a very, very bright future. There is just so many people. And that's just the the pitfalls of, of moto is that you can get hurt so easy. But I think it has a big impact on the positivity of the side-by-side -side stuff because it shows people the side-by-side -side stuff now is so good that it shows people that you can have, still have almost as much fun, at least for moto guys, right? Almost as much fun as a dirt bike on a side-by-side. -side. So it, it really... I think it's changing and growing the industry big time because there's a lot of like-minded people out there. Right. There was a time in, in the off-road industry where you either were the down and dirty grassroots guy or you were the well-funded, well-sponsored racing elite. And I think the UTV, one of the reasons why it's growing so fast is because it bridges the gap between the the low the low-lying grassroots guys and the the higher-end fully supported guys because 
there's such a big gap between those two steps. Like it's hard to jump from those from that lower tier to the higher tier. And and so the UTV makes it easy for most people to get into it at a decent price level and then have reap some of those rewards that racing brings uh, to the community. So, um, but but before we get too deep into the UTV stuff, um, did you did you make a return to motocross at some point? Yeah. So as I was going through the the rehab process, um, like I said, my mindset really didn't change. I was still really uh, uh, excited. I'm always goal driven and I'm really energetic, right? So like I would beat the stuff the crap out of punching bags. So I needed somewhere to put my energy. So I started thinking like, okay, I'll start riding bicycles again. And so I kind of started doing that. I could barely do it. I would fall down a million times. Like it sucked. Like, so it wasn't something I wanted to do. And then, um, as we were in California, I started building up my business. I actually, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about okay. that a little bit. Cause that has a lot to do with, um, what I do now. So knowing computers and being um, a different computer guy, I don't know if we want to call it the cool computer guy, but uh, you're a different computer guy, right? So um, at that time, uh, computer guys were really needed a lot. And so I started uh, doing side projects for other people, uh, maybe music industry. And I ended up doing uh, projects with uh, Mark and Tom from Blink-182 because I knew them. And uh, they ended up buying, I, I started my own little company and we would, you know, funnel all of the projects through there. They ended up buying my company from me. And uh, so that was pretty cool because I thought, okay, wow, okay, I don't need to work at Spy anymore. I can do my own thing. And so when they bought my company from me, they had me come on board with a company that they had called Really Likeable People, which is a parent company for a bunch of different uh, subsidiary companies that they had. And one of the companies that they had underneath was called LoserKids.com. And uh, don't mind the name. It was more of a uh, like a, sh- a shopping center that you, or a, a place that you could shop like Pacific Sunwear or Zoomies or Tillies or something like that. But it was all online. And um, it was awesome because they were such a huge marketing machine. They would drive all the sales to this place if they would just wear a shirt on the stage. Like so um, they had clothing brands and they had a bunch of stuff that would funnel through there. And um, at the time, there was only two people working for the company. And we were making 5 million bucks a year. So we had plenty to do. And it was just like the marketing machine was taking care of everything, right? So it was a really good good time. Uh, Oh, actually, I need to preface it by this too. So when I was in college and I did my college research paper, guess what company I did it on? (laughs) Loserkids.com. Right. And I had no idea who Mark and Tom were at the time. I just liked listening to Blink-182. And then (laughs) all this transpired. So... uh, Yeah. So it was cool because I learned so much, right? I learned you don't have to just be this go-getter with this great like dirt bike attitude, right? You have to have this business acumen. You have to be able to talk with people. And I'm meeting with big companies like Sony and BMG and Universal Music Group and all of these massive companies to do these projects for huge stars, Mary J. Blige, Tommy Lee. I mean, I could name off so many awesome people that we got to work with. And it was really fun because I got to see what people were like in business situations and what people were like outside of those situations too. It wasn't just like I was going to work at a computer company fixing computers. So it taught me so much and it, it really formed my mentality to be able to understand what to do with sponsors, what to try to do with marketing. Like I'm not a genius at any of this, but at least I know a little bit. Right. So moving on from there, I was like, okay, this business stuff, I think I know enough. I want to get back in racing again or do dirt biking or something. So we had an office in Solana Beach, California. It was actually really cool because we had uh, our clients from England and, and uh, overseas come in and we'd be able to hang out on the beach and do fun stuff. Um, but uh, I was sitting there one day and I was talking with one of the guys and he goes, well, why don't you just like get a mini bike or something? So I ended up going down to the local dealership and picking up a CRF 50, uh, just a little mini bike. And I tried to ride it around and I would fall down and I wasn't able to do it very good, but shoot, man, I tried for six months or so. And then boom, I got bigger handlebars on it and I started <laughs> riding it around a little bit. So I didn't do anything in the dirt. I just did it in the street at the office, but I, I learned how to do it, man. It was cool. It was like, uh, 
what do they say? You don't forget how to ride a bicycle. Well, I definitely forgot. I've got to teach myself. Again. <laughs> yeah. Your equilibrium uh, gets thrown off quite a bit when you don't have the rest of your body to throw into it. So yeah, that's a good point. I never thought of it that way, but you're right. So did you ever get to a point where you could actually do a full size bike again? Or was those, were those days over at that point? No, yeah, you, I, I did. Um, and then, so I graduated from that, like, uh, this is all probably over a span of three or four years, but I graduated from that to a, uh, KLX 110, which are obviously super popular right now in this uh, in age, but, um, I've got it all built up. I put some nice forks on it. Uh, Ian will know what I'm talking about. I put a nice Alpha shock on it. I got the extended BBR swing arm. I put the Marzell Q forks on it. Like it was dialed. Right. And then, so we would, uh, about an hour away was Lake Elsinore Motorsports Park. And so we would go to Lake Elsinore. Um, one of my employees, actually, he bought a, uh, a bike too. He had never ridden before, but he bought a bike. And so we would go on Tuesday mornings, we would schedule our, all our meetings to be on other days of the week. And we would go on Tuesday mornings to Lake Elsinore. And then, so first time I went out, I was horrible. I could barely go, but then, so I started getting better. And then, uh, at some point, like, again, Ian will know some of these guys, like Michael Byrne was out there, Josh Grant was out there, like all these dudes, and I'm seeing them jump all these jumps, and I'm like, okay, I might be able to hit some of these little ones on the on the 110, like, it's pretty good, so I'm out there in street clothes, paralyzed, with my helmet on, and I got this tricked out 110, and I'm going off the track, off the side of the track, going as fast as the 110 will go, and I'm hitting some of these big, like, probably 60, 80 foot jumps on a 110 and doing some of these awesome pro jumps. It was really cool. So like that was, again was like the same as going back to seeing my mom watch me, you know, put my hands on the countertop and stand up. It was another eye opener going, holy cow, man, you just a few years ago, a doctor told you that you were going to be sitting in a wheelchair and you told him to fuck off. And now you can do all this stuff. Like, look at what you're doing. It's amazing. Like another pat on the back, like, I don't want to sound like I'm self-absorbed or anything when I say these things. I was really excited for myself. Like I was so pleased that I could do this stuff. It was awesome. And then, so it kind of just got me the lit the fire. Right. And then, you know, wanting to get bigger bikes and do more stuff. That's yeah, awesome. Like when I hear about an elaborate pit bike build or one pen build, usually like up in the Pacific Northwest, you, we usually just associate that with heavy drinking. So, uh, <laughs> was, there, was there anything, anything going on in that regard? <laughs> we did have some fun nights, but we didn't do any, uh, parties jumping over fires or anything like that. Cause I was always too scared that I wouldn't be able to get up quick enough. if I landed. In. <laughs> so, uh, so what did the, what, did, how did your career move from that point? Cause were, you were still working in, in the IT slash entertainment space, um, at that point, right? Yeah, honestly, I just kind of started getting kind of bored with it. Like the whole dirt life kicked in again, man. And it was just like, all right, now that you can do all these things. And again, this is over a span of years. This wasn't just like a, a split decision overnight. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to get a big dirt bike. Um, but if I'm going to do any of this stuff, um, I think I might want to move back to Arizona, be closer to family. Like I started missing my family at the time. Like it was just a, a good move. So I actually ended up moving back to Arizona. And uh, this was... 2008-ish, maybe 2010-ish, and no, it was, it was 2008, and uh, I got a big bike when I moved back. It was a uh, YZ250F, and uh, it wasn't fast or anything. It was just like a good bike, right? It was reliable, and I didn't have to work on it that much, um, but I started riding it, and I actually went to a couple races, like local races, and I was, um, again, being paralyzed. I could barely hold on. I was using all my arm strength. I would do certain things to the bike. Um, I had a shifter where I could uh, press a button on the handlebars to shift it up and down. And uh, I only use front brake. Uh, since 1998, I've never, ever hit a rear brake on a motorcycle. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so um, even uh, during all my riding, all the mini bike stuff, everything. So um, it's funny because I've rode a, a million times since then. Um, but I figured out how to do it, right? Like I thought it was cool. So I was riding the big bike, went to a couple local races here and um, I was able to like, I, I just, I wanted to give back to my friends and they were all racing the pro class. And when you go to local races, you give uh, whatever the pot is, however many people sign up, that's the pot for the winner for the pro class. So it's called pro payback. So I would just sign up for the pro class because I didn't want to give the money to the track owner. I wanted to give it to my buddies. So I would just sign up for the pro class and put in my entry fee and just have fun and go 
race around with them. But the first race that I went to, I whole shot and I left for a full out with all the pros. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit, like I can still go pretty good. Like this is pretty cool. But then they didn't show me any mercy and they were like pushing their elbows on me and trying to <laughs> knock me down. So I was like, all right, fuck that. I'm going to stay back and like, go slow. It's like when I take off. So I'll let them whole shot and, and take off and beat me. But it was cool because it was, a, again, another eye opener saying, wow, like, holy cow, you can do things that you were never supposed to be able to do. This is amazing. And then so I thought to myself, all right, I'll try to race a couple more races and stuff. And then one of my buddies uh, said, well, they have this new event at the X Games. It's called the Super X Adaptive. And what it is is uh, guys that can ride dirt bikes. And uh, Ian might know who he is, but his name is Ricky James. He had a lot of videos uh, where he had this like cage around. He's uh, in a wheelchair. He doesn't have as much mobility as I do, but he had this like cage on his bike, uh, kind of like Doug Henry does. Um, and he started doing all these races and stuff. So they started this Super X Adaptive kind of around that same concept. And so um, there was guys that uh, had lost their leg. One of his name was Chris Ridgeway, a um, good friend of mine, and Ricky James and, and Rennell Cox and a bunch of other guys. But they invited us to go to the X games and I had to do a qualifier for it because um, they wanted to make sure that I was able to do it. And all these other guys already had their uh, been riding for a while and I was still kind of, we'll call it new at it. And then, so I went up to Michigan to do this qualifier and it was uh, called the extremity games. And it was at a place called Baja acres. And I went up there and I did fantastic. I actually won. And uh, I thought, cool um i actually got a gold medal for it i don't know if uh you want to see it but it's it's right here in the studio <laughs> wow that's awesome so uh and they did a, a cool little article on it but uh so it, it was pretty cool to to be able to do that win a gold medal and and it really again it was just like all these little milestones and stepping stones that happen to show you you don't have to like think about what everybody tells you no 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 like there's all of these pop abilities to be able to open up and I never thought even when I was racing professional I never ever thought I would be going to the x games like that's like the highest biggest level right like how cool was that and then so I qualified and I went and they treated us like rock stars man it was so awesome like I'd never been treated that good in any motocross environment ever um a little bit about the race that's pretty important is a life changer too is I thought I was going to be able to win or at least get on the podium. So I had it in my head the whole time that I was going to be standing there and I was going to get pictures and I was going to be like the dude. Right. So I was confident that I was going to do it. I ended up uh, getting a super bad hole shot and I ended up working my way back up to second place. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll, I'll be good. And right when I thought I'll be good, my brain slipped a little bit and I fell down in a corner and uh, I ended up high siding on the motorcycle, which means you fall on the, on the, the higher side and you have more momentum. And I hit the ground and I ended up breaking my arm. Uh, and it was like a pretty weird crash. So it looked, it looked kind of violent, but I just landed on my arm and I just broke my arm. But I said, all right, this is my one chance. I'm never going to be able to come back to the X Games again if I, you know, if I don't do good. So I got back up with a broken arm, passed two people, went to the podium and I didn't get on the podium, but I passed two people. And uh, again, with a broken arm, stood next to the podium, waited to hear all of their speeches because I was so upset that I didn't make it there. And I wanted to respect all the guys that beat me, listened to all of their podium speeches, told my dad to, uh, you know, see if he could start my bike for me. I ended up using my uh, other arm to be able to drive my bike back to the pits. He followed me back there. We went to Taco Bell and then we went to the hospital and got my arm fixed. Yeah, what, that's incredible, man. I mean, what you're talking about, Zach, Zach and I, uh, you and I are a little bit older than Zach. And what you, when you mentioned Ricky James, like literally not even five minutes earlier, what I was visualizing is uh, this. Is, I, I couldn't give you the exact year, but Transworld Motocross would start to put video clips online. This is like literally, I'm not going to say that this is like the inception of the Internet, but you're a dinosaur. We get it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's legit. I mean, you'd see these, you know, he's talking about the adaptive stuff and, and we would see Ricky out there strapped into his bike shortly after his accident. And uh, those clips that get posted up to Transworld, you know, Transworld almost every week was posting just all this killer content. You beat I mean, 
correct me if I'm wrong, George, this is back before YouTube. But, yeah, or at but least it's back before YouTube took off. You know, it so, really so, was. It was when yeah. uh, each and oh, Zach will know about this when each individual website had their own media player with a big hole, <laughs> Adobe streaming with an Adobe streaming server attached to it with a huge hosting bill. <laughs> no yeah. kidding. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, like Trans World, like I'd be watching almost daily and checking in on that site almost daily for new content that they would be dropping in there. I mean, you see everything from, uh, You'd see everything from him him riding that kind of the adaptive bike to Trey Kennard goon riding to freaking yep. it was just all kinds of stuff, man. And like I said, man, it's back before it was back before we got spoiled on YouTube and you had to kind of di- dive deep to find some stuff that you were interested in. But uh, yeah, 100%. So, yeah, and that was and back. I, I give, that was back before you had a full to subscription Rick. to ESPN and all these other services that cost 150 bucks a month. Pretty much. <laughs> And I give a lot of credit to Ricky too, because he's the, uh, well, we'll call him the godfather of that adaptive stuff because he's the one that inspired me to be able to get back out there. Cause I watched him for a couple of years before I even thought I was going to be able to get that mini bike. So kudos to him, man. He's an awesome dude. His yeah. dad's an awesome guy too. So, uh, so back then, back, back before the, you know, let, let's go back to like 1997, kind of who, who was the guy that you were really inspired by? Who was the guy that, you know, you would watch and just make you want to go grab, go grab your bike and go out for a rip. Who who was your dude? I think you're really going to like my answer. I got two guys. Uh, my first guy, when I was like, uh, I don't know, a 13 year old kid, I was always, uh, wanting Damon Bradshaw. Like I loved his cause, uh, um, yeah, dude, he was like, he was my guy. Right. But as I started getting a little bit older, I was an MC guy too. Yeah. My, my first guy was an old school episode uh, edition of motocross action. It was Ron Lachine. That's kind of why I made that, that, uh, that reference earlier, but you know, I was a McGrath guy too, but you always kind of wanted McGrath was so good and so dominant that you wanted to see guys battle with him and stuff. So I, w- I would find myself pulling for Emig and, and, uh, Ezra Lusk and guys like that, but, uh, no, I was killer. Damn. Yeah. Yogi was awesome. Ezra Yogi. Lusk was sweet. Yeah, I got I got I got tagged the other day in something to post up like ten athletes that uh, inspired you, and I put Yogi up. That, that's pretty cool. Nice. The the main reason I like Yogi is because I was I was always a Suzuki guy. So, <laughs> and, and when I started to really pay attention, Yogi was on a Suzuki. Yeah, that's cool, man. I never really I only had the Suzuki eighty, and I had uh, most of Yamahas for my career. Suzuki fanboy got really, really spoiled after 2000 with Pastrana and uh, Carmichael. <laughs> <laughs> so when we're talking about, you know, overcoming those and then falling down, getting hurt again and, and all that, what happened between uh, that point and then, you know, your first introduction to four wheels? Um, well, so it was a pretty uh, abrupt halt for the dirt bike stuff. So I ended up, uh, you know, going through all that shit at the X Games. I want to make sure that I mentioned this too, because this was like my claim to fame of all time, basically. But after I fell down at the X Games, uh, my sponsors were so happy because I was the only dude, even against the pro guys that weren't adaptive, that made sports better at the X Games <laughs> on two wheels. So I was like, yes, that was me. So everybody's like, well, at the bar looking at getting all these text messages they're like dude you ain't it but you're on sports center this is awesome <laughs> it's that it's that saying if you're gonna if you're gonna go out go out spectacular so the sponsors at least get their shot <laughs> <laughs> dude it was it, that's totally right but it was so not spectacular i looked like a total goon so it was like a total <laughs> backfire right but it was uh it was neat to see right so that's like again my claim to fame so it was neat but um you know i get back and i'm like okay I'll start trying to train for next year's X games. Cause I need my redemption. Like I'm that guy. I need, I need to win. And, uh, so I started riding at uh, these same local tracks that I was talking about that we raced at and I fell down again. And I broke my back again for the third time. So, um, that was it. Like I went to the doctor with, with my family and I just saw my mom and my sister, they just broke down and they were just like, I, right then I knew like they didn't even have to say a word to me. I was like, I got to figure something else out. Like, I got to, I got to find something else. So a couple of years go by and, um, I start riding bicycles because that's what I, you know, grew up doing. And, um, I didn't ride bicycles like BMX and stuff because I just don't have the torque in my legs and, uh, mountain biking. I couldn't get up some of the Hills. It was just too hard. And this was before e-bikes. So, um, I started riding road bikes, like where you were saying, and I, uh, for people that don't know, it's kind of like the Lance Armstrong stuff. And, 
I wasn't really that into it at first. And then I started seeing how I could challenge myself. And I was like, well, maybe I could go longer distances. Like maybe that's what'll make me happy. So there was always these like extra goals that I set for myself to be able to achieve. And um, it kind of started getting to the point where I was like, wow, I could, I could maybe do this. Like my legs are getting stronger. My body's getting more fit. I feel better. Like I'm doing a lot of good for myself. And I feel good. Like my, it's, it's given me mental clarity because I'm giving myself goals and things to look forward to. So it was one of those things like that. It didn't take away motocross, but it gave me something else to look forward to. So, uh, how did you get involved in UTVs? Right around that time when I started riding the bicycles, I, I was thinking to myself like, Oh, maybe I should get into like something else. Like maybe I think it was right around the time yeah, because I think rhinos had already been like somewhat cool. Like I didn't know about them, but they, I think they've been out for a few years. Like the racing versions? Years. No. Well, I did see like when I mentioned that I went to Lake Elsinore riding 110, I did see guys out there in the rhino, but like I was that cool motocross guy. I was like, who are those idiots driving that four-wheel drive thing? Like, <laughs> Oh, I, man, I was it the was, same but guy. This, <laughs> but this was at like the super infant stages when like, I don't even know what they were. Um, and I think it was actually like the IMG guys, like James Hill and a couple of those guys that were out there testing it. Um, but I still haven't confirmed that they, they think that we both saw each other, but we don't know yet. Um, so anyways, I was thinking like, all right, well, what off road is out there? And then like, as I started thinking about these things, one of my buddies just said, Hey, do you want to go to a Lucas off road race? And I was like, what the hell is that? Like, and I, I didn't know what it was. And he's like, yeah, there's like buggies and stuff racing. And I'm like, the, like the kind in the sand, like, what do you mean? And he's like, dude, just come check it out. And I'm like, all right, fine. He's like, all right, we'll buy the beer and we'll get you food and stuff. I'm like, okay, cool. I'll go. And then, so we, we went out there and, uh, I saw him and, um, I didn't really have any interest in the buggies. Like, and when you're looking from a, from a spectator standpoint and you're looking at Lucas track, it looks like they're going at a mediocre pace. Right. Like it, it doesn't look like they're going fast. And actually we had a conversation about this the other day. Anybody that's ever been to a short course race that's even done track walk is like, holy shit, this is way different than what it's like in the stands. Like yep. I can't believe it. Like, wow. And so I was that guy. I was told, I was like up there in the stands and I was like, yeah, this is kind of boring. Like whatever. And I saw the pro fours and I was like, well, that's a little bit cooler. Like that's pretty rad. And then uh, at the time I was working with a guy named Casey Curry and Casey Curry was in the pro light class. And uh, I told him, I said, well, Hey, you know, like, are these like, are these things cool? Like I'm a moto guy. And he's like, dude, just come out and try it. And so I went out and I tested in his pro light truck in Southern California. And the first thing, like I barely fit cause he's a littler guy and I'm, I'm a little taller and I barely fit in there and I could barely push on the gas pedal and stuff. But I remember he's like, dude, what are you doing? Like, you, you look like an idiot out there. Like you're going so slow. He's like, hit those big bumps, full wood, like go. And so I hit it as fast as I go. And I was like hooked right then. I was like, holy crap. Like, how is this truck taking this beating that I'm giving it to a, like a dirt bike? And he's like, dude, you could do more than that. Like imagine going out on the course and hucking this jump at like a hundred feet or 120 feet in one of these things. And then, so I got all pumped on it. I'm like, yes, this is the baddest thing ever. Like, it's so fun. It's protecting, like it's got a roll cage. It's awesome. And then he gives me the price tag and I'm like, nope, nope, <laughs> never. <happened." laughs> and, and, and not to, uh, <laughs> like downplay anyone else's experience, but freaking being introduced on a pro light, that's a, <laughs> that's a new experience for, for most people. But, um, but yeah, how did the, how did that translate into now your new perspective? Like, you know, you had this perspective of going from limitations to ability to back to limitations and then back to trying to build up again and, and revisiting all that process of building back up again. And then all of a sudden you find this new thing that gets that adrenaline going again. What was your perspective in that at that point? And then, and then how did that push you forward into where you went? Well, I think the perspective has been pretty much the same, but I think if you had seen the smile on my face and the excitement level after doing that, I think you would have been like, yep, this is like, I know exactly where he's going now. Cause it was just a, I mean, it was done. Like there was no other decision, right? Like how do I figure out how to do this? Um, but clearly I didn't have the money to do it. I was working on a computer guy's salary. You know, I had my company, I had to keep putting money back into it. Like I'm not going to be able to afford to do this. So 
again, like I was saying that the UTVs had kind of just started, like they just started being cool and getting better. Like, I think at the time there might've been uh, the Weller Racing SR1 class or something, but I had never seen them or anything like that. I think it was just like hopped up rhinos that were going out there. Um, so I was like, okay, I got to figure out how to get a pro light or do something. And I just couldn't figure out how to afford it. So I thought to myself, I'm still riding these bicycles. Like maybe I should do something with that. So I gave myself a five-year goal. I said, if UTVs are coming through, like maybe I'll just try to get one of those and try to just practice and have some fun. So I got, a, I ended up getting a Yamaha Rhino, I think in 2010 or 2012 or something. And we would just go out in the trails and just have fun, drink beers with the buddies and, you know, hang out and, so I, I was still getting a, a little bit of driving time in, not racing time or anything like that, but I was being able to understand how I could move my feet so I could press the gas and the brake. So I thought, how am I going to get into a pro light? If I'm going to do it and I'm going to race, then I have to figure out how to get a sponsor. And I set myself up a five-year goal, like I said, and the five-year goal was to be able to have a race vehicle at the end of five years. So I said, I'm going to make a name for myself by riding a bicycle, a paralyzed guy that shouldn't be able to be doing this. That's broken almost every single bone in his body. I'm going to try to use that story and get some sponsors. So I went ahead and in Southern Arizona, there's an event called El Tour de Tucson and it's kind of like the Tour de France kind of thing. And um, they have different miles. They have a 40 mile one, an 80 mile one and like 110 mile one. And then, so the first year I was like, okay, I'm going to train for the 40 mile one. And so I got good enough to be able to do that. And, uh, again, going through all this stuff, I like I make it sound like it's easy. Right. But I fell down so many times. I almost got run over a billion times. Like I had scratches everywhere. I could barely get up to go to work because my body wasn't used to it. And I was so tired. Like my bones hurt. Like it was crazy, all the bad stuff that you have to go through. But in the end it was good. Right. Because it's achieving a goal and it's really making me be a better human being. Real quick, and, the uh, the one thing I want to call out on that is that you went into that saying, I have this like five-year plan, like this whole thing where I'm going to, I have a goal, I'm going to take five years to get there. Whereas most of us in the UTV scene that want to go racing or do whatever, it's like, I have three months to get a sponsor. I got a month to build the car. I got a, you know, whatever. Like you were talking about learning patience. Like that's a huge, a huge life lesson right there that you can even say, I'm going to be five years out on this. Well, I don't disagree with your comment, but I don't think that I was that patient. I think that I was forced to look at it that way because of the amount of money that it would take to be able to get into a pro light. I was like, I have to like really think about this. Like I can't just do it. Um, but to fast forward, I, I ended up being decent at the bicycle stuff. I started getting little $500 a month here and there sponsors and just little stuff. Right. And started putting the money in the bank to be able to achieve my goal. Um, during that time, I ended up doing a bunch of different bicycle races and, uh, I ended up doing the 111 mile tour to Tucson and cool stuff happened. Like I was able to do it in a certain amount of time and, um, I got recognition and I was able to get a sponsorship from a company called Supercuts, and they cut hair in their nationwide chain and stuff. Um, and I started regionally and then I was able to start getting paid by the corporate company and it was really awesome. Right. And so what we would do is they cared about my my philanthropic story. They wanted to know how humans could be so good, right? And do these things that you aren't supposed to be able to be done. And so it was awesome. But I was able to use all of the stuff that I learned in business and marketing from all of the music stuff to be able to come up with cool campaigns to be able to pay them back. So um, it ended up, they were giving me a good amount of money to be able to do all of these things, paying for my bicycles, which uh, as you guys probably know, some of those carbon fiber road bikes are 10 grand to 15 right. grand. Like they're a lot of money. So I was able to start building up this, this repertoire with them. And during that time I would go to them and I would say, Hey, you know what? Let's go and have a campaign. Like if I can complete the El Tour de Tucson 110 mile race in under eight hours, if your haircuts are $11, you give everybody a haircut for eight bucks for the next two weeks, month, whatever it is. Right. And I'll go and I'll do these signings and I'll go do autographs and you can, we can go on the radio, we can talk about it and promote it. So we did all of these really cool campaigns around these stories and 
it was phenomenal because there was so many people on the side of the road in a town with um, Tucson has about roughly 800,000 to a million people. And all of these people are out there looking at me saying I was doing such a great job, right? It was so freaking cool. And I couldn't believe it. Like I was dumbfounded by it. And we would pass out coupons for these haircuts and different things like that. And so many people would go in. I mean, like for that campaign, Supercuts must have lost a ton of money that next month. But <laughs> during that next year, they said that their sales increased 33% for many, like 12, 16 months after that. So the amount of money that they gained back from doing these philanthropic journeys with us was phenomenal. And I would have never known any of that had I not been sitting in that hospital bed with my parents telling me to go get a computer job to do these marketing things that luckily happened with the Blink-182 guys. Like, it was full circle again. Like, it was so phenomenal. So, during that time when I'm riding a bicycle, I kind of needed a little bit more because I needed to, to make more money for the pro life. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was like, shit, what do I do? I can't just do another bicycle race. Like, people are getting tired of this shit. So, um, I thought, all right, what's something else cool? And then Ian will respect this. I saw Ricky James do an Ironman. I was like, shit, now I got to do an Ironman. But I'm a kid from Arizona. The most I've done in a pool is drink beer. Like I've never gone swimming. I've never done anything like that. So, and I can't run. So I got to figure out how to use these like high speed wheelchairs that they use. So I went through the whole process. I got a swim coach and I learned how to swim and man, I, to this day, I, I drink more water in the pool than I can actually do good swimming. Like I'm horrible at it, <laughs> but I had to learn how to swim a long distance to be able to do this thing. So I was in the pool every day for two years and, uh, you know, getting this, this speed wheelchair, I used a, a company called challenge athletes foundation. They granted me a, a wheelchair that you can use. And these wheelchairs are crazy because you don't even use, uh, your hands to push them. Like you use your knuckles, like you punch the wheels. And they have no brakes. Like they're anybody that thinks a dirt bike is sketchy. These wheelchairs are <laughs> ten times sketchier. So uh, I learned how to do all that stuff. And uh, after I think it was two and a quarter years or something of training, I was I got invited to actually do an Ironman. And I went out to uh, Oceanside, California, and I did a test with uh, the people at, in the Ironman organization. And uh, they qualified me and said I was good enough to be able to do an Ironman. And so they invited me to do the Ironman 70.3 in Oceanside, California. And uh, again, I wanted to do a campaign with Supercuts. So we had some cool outfits made and we had all these uh, cool things done. And uh, it ended up being really cool because uh, I completed my first Ironman in uh, just over six hours. Wow. I thought it was crazy. man. It was, it was really, really cool. And during that whole time, I remember thinking to myself, like, what am I going to do? I, I've never done a triathlon. I've never done a marathon. All I've done is ride my bicycle in the street. Like, what the hell am I doing? So they give you uh, the gun, they like, you know, that you start. And so we start swimming. And uh, it's, I think it was like a mile and a half or something in the Oceanside Harbor. But they, I don't know why the organizers did this. They have all the handicapped dudes like me go in front of the pros. <laughs> so right. it's like, it's, it was crazy. And then, so I'm swimming there like a freaking flounder, like just like barely getting through the ocean. And again, I'm horrible at swimming. And then these are these pros that are coming behind me. And I'm not talking about like five pros. I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of dudes right behind me. So I'm the slowest dude and all these dudes are professionals. And so they're swimming. And when they swim and you're next to them, they have this like weird thing where they, they'll uh, put their hands like almost in like fists. So you're, I was getting punched and kicked for a good 20 minutes <laughs> and I could barely even float. Like I was, I just, I drank so much water and barely finished the swim. It was so difficult, but I'm sitting there like with my stomach all upset and I get out of the water and like, I'm just like got all of the salt water in me. I'm like, all right, now I got to dry off and go ride the bicycle. So I just manned up and got on the bicycle and started going again in about 25 30 miles into uh i think it's 50 something mile bicycle ride i started going and it's in camp pendleton and if you guys know where camp pendleton and it's really hilly like there's tons of hills in southern california and 
we're going up this one hill and I make it, I don't know, a quarter mile up the hill. And I'm like, fuck man, this thing doesn't end. Like, holy cow. It's so like, I see all these dudes. They're built like Arnold Schwarzenegger. There's these super fit chicks. All of them are getting off and walking their bike. I'm like, what the heck, man? Like, how are these people? Like, I'm never going to make it. So I'm going like super slow. And if, uh, if you guys know, like when you on your bicycle, if you can't make it up a hill, you can kind of do like the snake pattern and go back and forth. And it makes it so that you're easier because you're going up a, a diagonal way, right? Each side, like each side incline, way. right? Exactly. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to keep doing this for as long as I can. And I'm like, beat. I'm so tired. My stomach hurts. Like I don't have any energy. So you drank all of a sudden, like I five drink. gallons of salt water. <laughs> yeah, it was it was gnarly, right? And so I was like, "All right, I'm gonna just keep going as far as I can." And so right about that time, I just lost my lunch and I started throwing up everywhere. So I'm throwing up over like all of these people that are like getting off their bikes. Like these are fit athletes, and I'm throwing up over all of them. And I just keep going, and I finally I make it to the top of the hill and crest the top of the hill. And I'm like, holy, and this is after a good 30 minutes of just like oh, torture. And I'm like, okay, good. Like I made it like, hell yeah. Like finally I made it to the top of this big ass hill. It was so gratifying. I couldn't believe it. And then, so I ate a granola bar and I just bombed <laughs> it down the hill and passed the whole bunch of kids as fast as I could. Man, just hearing this, he hearing your story, just, uh, I'll be honest with you, it just makes me feel lazy. Cause like, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I remember, I remember Ricky James story and combined with Ricky James was Ryan Hughes. And any, anytime I would see content about Ryan Hughes, I'd just literally sit there and just like, man, you're just blowing it. Ian. you're just so lazy. <laughs> like screw this work stuff, man, go live life, you know, but that, that's so sick. I don't know, man. And, and I, uh, looking back on it, like in hindsight, like, I feel like I was so naive, like some of those things now, and, and I'll kind of preface this, but I wouldn't want to do them again. Like they're just too much. Like, I don't know what I was thinking, trying to do these things. Maybe my goal at the end of the five years of getting into the off-road just consumed my whole life and just made me do these things for no reason or good reason, I guess you could say. Um, but so I did that and I, I ended up going down the hill and I, I got in the wheelchair and I did the running portion of the race and I hauled ass and I almost crashed the wheelchair because it was so sketchy. Like all of these little things happened during the race, but the minute I crossed the finish line, I, you know, my uh, fiance at the time and my whole family, everybody was there. I go, I'm never doing one of those again, ever. Like I'm done. Like there's no fucking way you could ever get me back there to do that again. Like I'm good. Like I've accomplished this portion of it. If we don't get any money for our sponsors for doing that, like, cause that was way too insane. Like anybody that does a triathlon, whether it's a half Ironman, an Ironman, they're gnarly. Like that is difficult. It is really difficult. Riding a dirt bike, in my opinion, is way more fun. <laughs> so at, at that, after all those races and, and the Ironman and everything, at what, how far away were you from getting into a car? Uh, the next step was for me to like, talk to supercuts so i had to actually preface like uh before i did the iron man i said if i complete these things and do these things let's have a conversation about me getting into uh some sort of other form of racing uh after i get these things done because uh, when you have sponsors you have to work with them on a consistent basis so i'm talking to them weekly monthly so these conversations are always happening right um right when i crossed the finish line and i said that i knew that the next step was like my next phone call next week is going to be something different. Like I'm not doing this stuff anymore. Like I like riding bicycles, but that's it. So I called him and I said, Hey, like I've been looking around. I understand the pro light is way too expensive. Four or five years have gone by. UTVs are starting to become popular. Like Glarus razors out now. Like they have 900s and 1000s. Like they look like they're pretty cool. I've seen like the Merrill brothers, Jason and Jeremy Merrill, they're out there winning championships in their 900s and stuff. And, you know, like I, I've been researching it because it's a good entry level form of racing, right? Like you said, Zach, it's it's somewhat affordable. Like you can kind of get into it. Obtainable. So yeah, and I we we have to use that as a loose term, right? Like we're doing a project right now and, and it's it's in my mind and it's a loose term because there's a lot of people that may or may not be able to afford it. Like it it's fifty fifty. I mean, who knows if they can do it. But in my mind, it was doable. It wasn't pro light oh. money. 
for for the record, we're talking about racing. You know, anybody can get financing on one of these things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. racing's a different animal altogether. It really is, and and so my goal was to to not use my paycheck to be able to go racing. Of course, you have to do that. Like that's just the way it is. But at least my goal in the beginning was to try to get as much of it funded as possible. And uh, I didn't want to affect like my future, you know, like I said, at the time I had a fiance and stuff and I didn't want to make it like horrible for her and stuff. So I ended up asking Supercuts if they could pay for half of my first UTV and they said yes, or half of my first race UTV. And they said yes, because I already had the Rhino. So I was driving that around. But um, I had saved up during that 10 year or five year time. I had saved up about 10 grand. And they put up the other 10 grand. So we had 20 grand to be able to buy a race UTV. And uh, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to have to do this myself because I can't find any race UTVs. So I went out and bought a Razor 900, an orange one. We called it the pumpkin. And it was just a stock one. I was just going to put like doors and just barely get it legal to race and go out there and race it. But then all of a sudden, uh, Jason and Jeremy Merrill put two cars of race cars of theirs for sale on race desert and i was like whoa these things are like next level like this is an this is like ricky carmichael factory bike jeremy mcgrath factory bike level like i'm ready to like i need this so instead of me wasting all my money and all my time building the pumpkin as we call it i sold it uh for whatever we ended up getting for it and then i used that as my like entry fees and stuff for the first couple races and I used all the money that I had saved up in Supercuts, and I went over to California, and I met with uh, Jason Merrill for the first time, and I said I want to buy that car. And I gave him cash, and he gave me a bill of sale, and that's how uh, all that relationship started. I asked him like, I don't know, a hundred questions in the next three days. Like <laughs> he was so pissed at me. He was like, "Dude, quit bothering me." <laughs> like. <laughs> I had so many questions because I wanted to do good, right? And uh, he's like, bro, just go drive it. And so I did. And I went out and, and figured out how to drive it. And I drove it decent. And we had like, we had to do some customization with the pedals, like make the pedals taller and just, you know, little stuff so I could drive it properly. Um, but I went and uh, drove it at a practice motocross track here in Arizona. And when we were over there, I was riding the vet track, what they call it. It's like a, a mild motocross track and I was doing pretty good. And then, so I took it out on the motocross track, which I wasn't supposed to. And I jumped <laughs> on the jump second lap and they're like, get out of here. Get out. Like, You're not allowed over here. And then, so that was like another eye opener for me because I was like, wow, this is really getting me back to what I love. Like I love racing dirt bikes and now I don't have to get hurt anymore. I'm in a cage. Right. This is, this is like the best thing ever. This is best thing since sliced bread. And uh, so then I was like, okay, now I got to get fast. And so one of the guys that was racing uh, Lucas off road at the time, his name is Jake Ubeda. And uh, he actually lived in, in Southern Arizona at the time. And I said, will you meet me out at the track and tell me if like I'm any good? Cause I think I'm going super slow, right? Like going dirt bike speed compared to UTV speed. Like it's a totally different mindset. So when I'm in the UTV, I'm going at what I think is as fast as UTV can go, but it feels like like slow motion in my head. The perspective from the handlebars versus the the steering wheel is a quite a bit of different experience, even though you're going the same speed. Yeah. And I think that that's what I didn't understand, you know, but, um, so I asked him, I was like, come out and, and tell me what I'm doing. And then, so we get out there and I'm doing my laps and stuff. And he's like watching me and he's like, dude, if you can go that fast, you'll win. Like you could win at Lucas. I'm like, no way. There's no way. These guys are like, they would kill me. He's like, go out and try it. So I was like, all right, I'll do it. And so I go to my, my first races and I don't remember how I did it in my first race, but, um, I think I did three or five, three to five races my first season. Unfortunately to this date, I've never completed a full Lucas season. Uh, but I think I was on the podium, you know, roughly 60% of the time that I was, that I raced my first Lucas races. So it was like eye opening again. I go, wow, this is pretty cool. The times that I wasn't on the podium though, it was expensive because I either crashed or broke. So it was another eye opener. It's like, yeah. man, you're going to need some serious cash to be able to do this. Right. But I had good partners and I had the support, you know, at the time, Jason and Jeremy Merrill saw me doing decent. And so they gave me like, I was like their little sideshow. Like they let me park next to them and <laughs> could hang out and have fun. So it really started that whole camaraderie 
everything. And I was like, wow, I'm back at the races. I have good friends. These people are living their same dirt life. We all have the same uh, fun together and we all have, we're like-minded. It was just so cool to be back at the track. What kind of life changes were happening at that point? Did you, did you go through any kind of, um, did you change your career at all or were you still doing the marketing thing or, or kind of what was life like at that point? Um, during that time, like, uh, some of the stuff had, sh- had switched in the music industry. So, um, I didn't really expect on change, but, um, website stuff, cause I was doing a lot of website building and stuff it had kind of slowed down. So we started a distribution company at the time and the distribution company was distributing uh, merch, kind of like what lizardkids.com was uh, for all these different bands like Red Bull Records and Christian bands, Sugar Ray, like all these crazy different brand, uh, bands and brands and stuff. So we were shipping out a bunch of merch and what we it was easy because what we would do is we just set up all of the online presence and all the distribution and we would take a percentage of what their profits were and we would do all their stuff for them. So we would get it all printed, we would do everything and they didn't have to do anything except for go play a show. So it was pretty cool and, and uh, that business only lasted like two years though because Napster came out and fucking killed it. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but I got lucky. I ended up selling that business before, uh, before it tanked. And, uh, I was able to use a little bit of that money to be able to fund some of the racing. Um, like I said, I didn't want to dip into my pocket, but I, racing is expensive. So I had to, um, it was just kind of the way it went. And I had that Razor 900 for one year and I kind of learned how to do my, my due diligence in racing. And then I started getting in the one thousands and, hanging out with the Merrill brothers more. And it just started really doing good because I was one of usually one of the fastest guys on the track. And we talk about it like it's again, like it's easy, but it wasn't like every single time, whether it was qualifying or practice or a full on race, I would come off the track and whether I would tell anybody or not in my head, I was thinking to myself, like, Holy shit, George, here's another pat on the back for you. Like, Can you believe that you're a broken individual handicap and you're going out and competing against these guys that are professional race car drivers and you're able to do the same things that they are with a slightly modified vehicle? Like you should be really proud of yourself. So every time I would come off the track, even if I was pissed that I lost, I could still rest on that. So it was still a win. So how did you get into the unicorn? So during the Lucas stuff, like we heard that Yamaha was coming out with a manual shift and Ian will probably agree with this. Like, um, I don't care what side by side I drive now, all of them are fun, but at the time it was only the Razor 1000. Right. And then we hear, Oh, there's going to be a manual shift one. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is right up my alley motocross. Like, here we go. Like I'm going to be able to shift a UTV. This is the best thing to happen since sliced bread again. Like, Holy cow. So, I just went down to the store and I bought a Yamaha and I said, okay, cool. I sold the, the race car that we had before. And I was like, I got to figure out how to build this one. So it was my, uh, kind of my first foray into like building race cars and stuff. So totally took it upon myself, built the whole thing with some, uh, you know, help from friends, welding it up and doing everything and learn how to build race cars, bend pipe, do fabrication, all that stuff. And, uh, it kind of just went, took off from there. In 2016, the Yamahas were clearly faster than the Polaris and the Lucas series, and we did really well. And um, I got noticed a little bit by the guys at Yamaha, and I started talking to them a little bit and um, did some uh, promotional stuff for them. We sold a lot of vehicles for them. We went to a lot of events for them. And I worked with them for um, probably 14 months, maybe. Uh, and then finally, I asked them, I said, hey, you know, do you guys think you'd be able to help support us? And uh, their answer was no. Their answer was no, we don't have the budget, man. Sorry. And I said, well, you know, what if we do some other stuff? If we try to get creative with it? And they said, no, it's it's not going to happen, man. And then uh, three months later, they called me and they said, hey, we found some budget. (laughs) And I said, wow, that's that's fantastic. And I said, you know, what what can we do? What do you want me to do? And they said, well, what do you need for the year? And I didn't want to be greedy or anything. So I just said, you know, whatever you guys can do. And they sent me two cars and. We were able to get, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, motor program together and we were able to get sponsors from them. So a lot of the Yamaha companies that work with Yamaha were able to come on board with the program. So it was like, wow, my 2016 program was just full amateur do-it-yourself 
guy. Now I can, you know, have a little bit rest on a little bit of this, you know, corporate help. It's going to be awesome. So, um, little did I know that 2017 was going to be a year for the books as far as R and D and development goes, but, um, I was pretty good at understanding how the programs work. So Yamaha used me for a lot of the development of the machines. And so we would do a lot of different tune testing, oil testing, intense, any type of R&D. We would do it in a race platform. And uh, unfortunately, that ended up being a lot of DNFs for me because we had so many different mechanical things happen. Not to say that there was anything wrong with the vehicle, but when you're testing, it's 50 50, whether it's going to work. Right. Right. And some of the decisions were good. Some of the decisions were, were not so good. The best part about it was, is that it increased the level of racing and the, the vehicles tenfold by the time we were done, but it was a struggle for me because I was just a racer that wanted to go out there and win. Right. But it was another learning curve. It was another thing. Like I told you before, I had to be able to understand patience. I had to rest my head on the things that I was doing and being happy with and it made me understand how sponsors actually work. You're not always there to win the race. Some of the guys are, but right. you may not be. Right. It's whatever they need, not what I need. It, it's kind of funny that you singled me out saying coming from Moto and stuff that you went into the YXE because the YXE was my first side by side. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I put about 3,500 miles on it. Uh, I did a couple overland trips on that thing. And basically the reason I chose the Yamaha is, I mean, you're talking 2017 and all anybody could talk about is what that car wouldn't do. And I would yep. just tell them, I'm like, watch. Okay, watch. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. for the record, George, uh, Ian and his brother Ben both bought YXZs and did the Washington BDR from Oregon to Canada or yeah, Oregon to Canada um in a week and uh were the first ones ever to do that and uh it was in a yxz yeah nice it was, dude. Uh, it, it was two and a half days buddy <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, we knocked it out pretty quick but that's but, yeah, rad yeah i mean the yxz the yxz has you know all these machines have their pros and the cons but you know there's one thing you can't say about a yxz and that's the, that it's not tough those things are they're a tank yeah, the one hundred percent, and that's one of the things that we always loved so much about them is they were reliable. I've For never sure. broken an axle on a YXZ ever. Yeah, I, I in thirty five hundred miles, I I finally had a serviceable part break, and I had a tie rod break. I mean, and to change out a tie rod on a YXZ, it takes longer to get ready to do it than it does to do it. So it was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're a great car. Yeah, I, I definitely give them a lot of credit for what they are. But like you said, I mean, each car has their good stuff and bad stuff. So uh, you were you were running this uh, race program with the Yamahas, and it seemed like things were on the up and up. How did that progress, and, and where did it go from there? Well, unfortunately, my results were shit, so like I didn't have a choice. <laughs> like I didn't I didn't want to go in asking for more. Has, has I not produced anything? Like uh, in racing, results are everything. So it doesn't matter what you're doing. I, I was doing a lot of good stuff, and they were doing a lot of good stuff back for me. But to continue on that path was completely useless for both of us. It was completely useless to them because we had already done all the development. The vehicle's not going to get any better than what it is. 90% of the stuff that you see on YXZs now was because of the things that myself and other racers did in those racing years. It's like, so all of that stuff was done. Like, they, that's it. Like, it's it's water under the bridge now, right? So if I'm not going to be able to produce results, I'm not going to be showcasing the vehicle anymore or selling vehicles anymore, then my time is limited there. So um, I didn't even ask to renew the contract. I said, you know, do you guys want to do something else in the future, like a different type of campaign, like not racing? And they had just decided that they were going to keep with the racing stuff. And there was already new young guns like Brock Hager uh, and a couple other guys that were out there. And they totally deserved it way more than me. So they got it. So what was the, like, how do you talk to the, to the main sponsor like that when you're saying, Hey, the car is, is awesome. And this is a lot of fun, but you know, if we're going to be keeping the, the ability for me to finish and, and podium down by the fact that we're swapping stuff in and out all the time and, and all that, I mean, how does that conversation happen? Like, is it even like an option to talk outside of that realm or is it just basically, you know, that's what it is. Well, I think this goes back to, uh, it's a kind of a long formed answer, but I think it goes back to all of the stuff that I learned in business before I got into this racing stuff. 
if I was just a racer, I would talk to them like a racer. I would talk to them like, like we can't do use that part because I need to go win. We can't. I got to go win. But I saw the understanding that we're trying to build a vehicle. We're trying to build uh, a program. We're trying to build longevity out of a company. And we would have these open discussions, uh, whether it be at Yamaha or whether it be on the phone, whatever it is. And we could understand what each other needed. And some of those discussions were really heated. Some of those discussions were one-sided, whether it be on my side or their side. But the fact is, is that the only thing, and I learned this very, very quickly, the only thing that we're there for is to win races or to move their corporation forward. And that's what we were doing. Right. We moved those programs forward whether it be for me or not, didn't matter to them. So I had to understand that. I had to take myself out of the equation. I'm just one of the employees at that point. Whether I'm a top-level racer, a tester, an R&D guy, you're still just one of the guys. And so you have to know that and be able to go forward with that mindset. So it teaches you patience. It teaches you everything. And it's it's pretty crazy because every dude that races, right, they're the baddest dude. They can do this, and they can go out, and they can win races. They deserve this. That's not how it works, man. Uh, it's interesting that you say that because I've had a couple run-ins with the OEs, you know, and, and they're, they're, it's just a different animal altogether. You know, uh, Yamaha, Yamaha came out pretty heavy in 2017 at uh, Dune Fest, which is a big event on the Oregon coast. And they brought out one of their engineers from Japan. And of course they got, he's walking around with an American marketing guy and that he was kind of acting as his translator. And what's funny is that they singled me out because I was one of a handful of guys there that were on a YXZ and they come in, they want to interview me. They want to interview why I made the choice. And, and basically I told them I came from bikes and it seemed like an exhilarating ride. It seemed like kind of a cross between a rally car, uh, I felt like I, I felt like I was going to have the most amount of fun on the Yamaha and let's call it what it is too. It was actually pretty affordable. And I started to have this conversation with them. I go, honestly, the part of the reasons I chose it was based on the fact that people were telling me what it couldn't do. I wanted the reliability. I wanted the exhilaration. I wanted the shifting. I went on and I can't, I'm not even making this up. I went on for probably a minute and a half telling this, these two guys why I chose it. This dude, this American marketing agent for Yamaha literally looks at the engineer and he points, he goes, Polaris here, Yamaha way up here. <laughs> I'm like, really? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, dude, that's not what I said. <laughs> it was yeah. so bizarre, man. So it is pretty crazy. Like it's it kind of goes back. That's a society thing, though, right? Whether it's with manufacturers or with a guy that you're talking to at the street, they care about what they care about. So your uh, program moved forward and uh, you ended up uh, stepping away from that program, the Yamaha program. Uh, what did the, the tra trajectory look like going from there? Adam, I mean to correct you, but I didn't step away from Yamaha. I stepped away from uh, having support from them for racing endeavors. So uh, I still have a good relationship. I still to this day have a good relationship with Yamaha and uh, I love the vehicles. Um, I don't actually get to drive the vehicles that much anymore. But um, as I understood those things with racing, I understood the value of what racers are. And I don't mean to devalue any racer, but a racer is results or marketing, right? Yep. They're, or in my case, research and development. You can go get a research and development guy that doesn't have to win. So I was, okay, that's already one thing gone. So I thought to myself, what is the next step? Because there's no value in any racer, whether they do best in the desert, Lucas, any type of racing, unless they're showcasing themselves in a different way than everybody else. And what I mean by that is I understood that Lucas only gets so many TV views when they get people out on the track. Most of the time, there's going to be one guy that gets 90% of those TV views for that race. That means the other 20, 30, 10 guys that are in that race get zero. Right. So the ratio is like right there. It's flawed, right? It, for any type of marketing. So I thought to myself, all right, now I have to go out and figure out what my core value is going to be because it's clearly not in racing. Research and development is done. Now I need to move forward. So I had to set 
I'm not going to do the Lucas series anymore because I need to go out and showcase other stuff. The UTV World Championship was a cool race, so I want to go do that one. And I started looking at other series like uh, Texplex actually has a cool series now. And I started kind of looking at those new series that the UTV stuff were coming up with. Johnny Greaves and all those guys were doing fantastic stuff out there on the East Coast. And there's a, a bunch of stuff that's available now, right? And so I thought, why would I single myself out as being the guy that's in the front of the pack in the Lucas series or one of the other series if I can go do all of these ones and show up at all of the different ones, just poke my nose in, be on the camera for doing something else. So I thought, okay, well, I'll go poke my nose in all of these different ones in 2019 and have some fun and showcase my story and be able to share some positivity and, and maybe some life experiences with some of these people. And not only that, but it's going to give me a lot more hands to shake. I'm going to be able to meet a lot of people. I'm going to be able to have a lot of fun. Uh, all of my crew guys are going to have a fantastic time. We get so much good experiences traveling across the country. I mean, look at Ian, how far Ian went today. So it's like <laughs> he started all, in the sun and now he's in the dark. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to go to this audio. <laughs> so sorry it's taking so long, Ian. But yeah, so oh, no, no those problem. experiences are 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 out of this world. And and so I thought, why not you know dip my hand in all of these different things and make my marketing engine shine more than everybody else's. Uh, unfortunately, that got cut short because of the 2019 UTV World Championships, uh, I was injured very, very heavily. Um, we, uh, we had a project going leading up to that race. Uh, it probably started in November and the race was in April uh, and it's called Project Unicorn and it was building a YXZ. Um, that was a trail car that was kind of a race mobile at the same time. Uh, we had some of the, the same sponsors that we had involved in the Yamaha program jump on board. Um, and that was kind of the kickoff to the doing it different. Um, we started marketing it different. We started not just showcasing the builds and the products that you would do on it, but showcasing the story that leads to the build. We would have people come over and we would showcase them helping with the car. We would go to the manufacturers of these products like Graves Motorsports or uh, these tune-up shops, and we would showcase the things that they do. And we would, we would help uh, really understand who these people are that are really into all this racing stuff, very similar to like what you guys are doing with me right now and, and helping them share their story instead of just sharing a product. So it was really cool to have that stuff. And this Project Unicorn turned into a phenomenal car that has so many cool products. We even got a company like AEM, which barely had any products in the UTV market. We were able to develop marketing campaigns and, and give them a vehicle to be able to produce car uh, components for a Yamaha YXZ. Like all of these things worked out so great because of the campaign and because of this Project Unicorn. Um, the reason that we call it Project Unicorn is because <laughs> it kind of goes back to what Ian and I both talked about, but I was never supposed to be able to walk again. I was never supposed to be able to race again. I was never supposed to be able to ride a bicycle again. There should have been no possible way that I could have ever driven a stick shift Yamaha side-by-side, -side, let alone a stick shift Yamaha side-by-side -side race car. So that was my unicorn. We called it Project Unicorn, and uh, clearly we had stickers made and cool, cool colors and stuff on it. But um, actually, I should say this too: a really funny story is we posted those things. Um, you know how the comments go on the internet, but uh, <laughs> so we posted things, and we we're talking about how cool it was. And and you know when we do these videos, like you see the, the pink and uh, yellow and blue colors and stuff, and you see how this car, like it's it's awesome, like the way it's built and stuff. But people who don't know. One guy commented and he goes, that's the gayest fucking car I've ever seen. Like, get rid of it. Right, <laughs> I'm, like, right. I'm like, yes, my campaign was successful because he's paying attention and he had no idea about this thing. So it's perfect that he said that. Yeah, standing out uh, in the crowd is not an easy thing to do. And and when the eyeballs are there and, the, and they start reacting, you you know you're doing it right. Dude, it, it, it's it, such a trip that you're talking about AEM and them coming to the table to build products for the y, YXV. You'd never guess who my entire gauge cluster was made by. <laughs> my really? YXZ. Oh yeah, I got all my parts from uh, Corey and Jason Waller. Uh, yeah. I mean, still to this day, if if there's something that I have to get on my, on my K and M or any sort of advice, uh, that's they're my first call. So. 
Yeah. And there's so many fantastic people in the industry, man. Like everybody's got their favorites and stuff. We actually did a video yesterday that I think uh, Zach signed in on with shock therapy and they were talking about tuning and stuff like that. And um, it's amazing to see all of the relationships that they had, but there's tons of people outside of those people that do it too, man. So it, you can never be like, Oh, these are the best. Like there's so many best. Yeah, it's just like motocross. Uh, uh, side by sides are going the route of motocross. You know, we're we're racing drives innovation, and oh, you yeah. know, when, I, when I'm out there building a car that I know is going to be a great overlander rig, I know that if I'm running those high end racing components, that I'm I'm putting myself in the best possible position to start and finish that 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 ride. Yeah, one hundred percent. I agree with that wholeheartedly. I was actually putting on some parts on uh, this project that we have for this RS1 that we're doing. And, uh, you know, I'm used to putting on like, I don't know, tie rods that were started being made a couple years ago. The new stuff that came out this year, like uh, I'll mention them, Zollinger Racing, the stuff that they, the quality and products that they make, it's all hardened steel. Like they have, uh, one thing that blew my mind was they have uh, tie rods on the clevis of the tie rod the bolt that goes into the steering rack, usually we, in racing situations, we would red Loctite it because, and use a boatload of it because it would usually come out. Well, now what they're doing is it's all hardened. They have a, uh, it's a Torx bit and they have a channel in the head and then they have a lock screw that goes in and locks it into the clevis. Like that to me, like it's so little, but that's a game changer. Yeah. And yeah. UTV parts are coming so far. Yeah, George, I'll quote, uh, I'll quote Steve Bouchard as it relates to Zollinger. He was, uh, uh, he doesn't make parts, he makes solutions. And I totally agree Dude, with that. That's a great way to put it. I got to start saying that on the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, you know, what's funny is that, you know, he, he, he's a guy that I've met at a number of events and I'll, I'll talk shop with him here and there. And, you know, I've sent him, I've sent him some product more or less like, you know, what you're doing over there is crazy. Like I, if I remember right, the last thing we sent him was a little 20 amp hour battery saying, Hey dude, could you try and find a home for this on a Honda Talon? He's like, absolutely. <laughs> so, nice. Yeah. Yeah. He's a killer guy. That goes to show about the business relationships and all that for stuff. Sure. That's valuable. That's definitely something that we've talked a little bit about. And, and Ian and I have talked a lot about is, is the relationships and the off-road community, um, the, the professional side, and then just the community side, both have almost equal weight in your day-to-day -day operation of these UTVs because the 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 vendors they want you to have a good time they want you to succeed they want you to make it to point b and the community wants to see you get there they want to be there with you like everybody's working and rooting for you no matter who you are uh there's a few bad apples in the community but they get weeded out pretty fast uh because the rest of the community really wants everyone to succeed and to to achieve their goals and to have the best baddest ass time they can possibly have on these cars but um to to get back to where we were going with that, you you went to the UTV World Championships in the Unicorn, and you brought all the sponsors on board to build this unique vehicle. And then uh, it comes for race day. You know what was the mindset going into that, and then and then where'd that lead? Yeah, so um, it seems like suspension's been my Achilles heel when I have these bad incidents. But uh, you know, I broke my back and I didn't have good suspension at Glen Helen. And then uh, at the UTV World Championship, we were fighting suspension issues as well. And uh, so my, uh, my dad and my uh, crew chief at the time for that race, we woke up early and we went out to the track and we revalved our shocks ourselves and uh, got them working quite a bit better. But unfortunately, that left me pretty tired the uh, morning of that race because I only got a couple hours of sleep. So um, I want to make sure that I preface all this stuff by saying all of the stuff that we're going to talk about now is racing incidents. And it's very, very unlikely that any of this stuff happened to anybody when you hear the story that I'm about to say, it's a lot easier to get struck by lightning when there's not a storm than to have the things happen <laughs> Right. that happened to me. So it's very, very unlikely that these things will happen. So please don't take any of the things that we're saying is uh, we don't like racing because I'm going to go back to the UTV World Championships and race. So I'm very comfortable with saying that it's unlikely that things will happen like this again. But I went out there uh, in the morning and uh, we didn't get a good hole shot. Like I ended up, uh, I don't know, three quarters of the way in the field, like maybe 15th or so um, through the first few turns. I was just basically sleeping because I was so tired. Um, so we went towards the back of the back section of the track. And as we started getting more into the desert section, um, I, I think I passed up to maybe fifth place or something. Um, 
And uh, in fact, to this day, uh, Ryan O'Hara from Fuel Wheels, uh, I bet him the morning or the day before at tech and registration, I said, I'll whole shot you um case of beer whoever whole shots and uh he beat me so i still owe him a case of beer <laughs> um but uh he said that when i was going through the pack on my way up towards the front that uh, i blew by him like he was standing still so it was comforting for me to hear that because i, under I understood that my pace was good and i could have done well um but unfortunately during that time when i was passing uh another driver i ended up tipping the unicorn on its side and it was kind of in like a blind corner area where you went over a little hump and then you hung a right hand turn. Um, but it wasn't too bad. Like drivers could still get around and stuff like that. Uh, so I, there was a, a guy, his name is Tommy, um, Tom Lee, but Tommy gun images, he does photography for the UTV races and for boat racing and stuff, but he was kind of down the track a little ways. So I stayed in the car when it was tipped over because I wanted the track to be clear. And I knew that there was more, uh, what do you call it? stages of drivers coming like every two or minute or so, like 20 more guys comes. So I wanted to make sure that it was clear. So I had to wait till all those guys came and he kind of like waved his hand in the air and flagged. It was clear. So I got out of the car and I walked to the side of the track and I waited there for a little while because I didn't want to be on the track when vehicles were passing by. And then, so I didn't hear anybody coming and, you know, I kind of like looked at over at Tom and he was like, just, you know, nothing was going on. So I walked back down to the car. I was fine. And I was like trying to push the car back on its wheels. It was just on its side. So I thought, okay, you know, I might be able to do it. And, uh, well, I did, I couldn't do it. I was just too weak. It just wasn't happening. It was too heavy. Um, and then, so I started, like, I, I didn't hear anybody. And I started walking back to the side of the track. Cause I was like, man, my race is done. Like it's, it's over, you know, it's, I'll just wait till the safety crew gets here and flip me back over and I'll just finish the race. But obviously I wasn't going to win or anything. So, um, as I started making my way to the to back, excuse me, back to the side of the track, um, a driver came over the the crest of this little jump, and uh, he went to clear me, and he was clear of me. Um, and let's just preface this by saying, when I walked around the car, I walked around the rear of the car um, because nobody was coming, and my skid plate was kind of facing towards the inside of the berm, so where everybody would come so like if somebody came over they would just like fall like go into the car and hit the skid plate um so he came over and he cut he cleared me and went to get past and uh there was another guy behind him that didn't see and he smashed into him full speed and so it ended up taking his car and going into me and then so his car hit me and the driver's door so when you talk about the driver's door on a race car you have an a pillar uh, like a, a window guard and then you have the B pillar. And then in between those pillars, you have uh, a solid piece of metal, like a door that doesn't open, like where you would hang uh, your arm on your passenger car out the side of the window. And that door bar usually has a window net that goes up from the, the door bar to the roof. And that door bar hit me in the jaw between my neck brace and my helmet and smashed me between my car and his car and shoved me through his window net and broke all of his metal out. And the bar ended up, uh, it didn't even mess up my helmet at all, but it basically was like an uppercut to my jaw through those two safety devices. And it shattered my jaw, broke all my teeth, um, shattered my skull, uh, ended up crushing all my nasal passages, all my eye sockets. Uh, my eyes became somewhat disconnected from my head. I had blood coming out of every single orifice of my uh, head, my ears, my nose, my eyes, my mouth. Um, it broke my collarbone. Um, and I forgot what other damage it did, to, um, like my shoulder or something. Um, but it really, really, really did some serious damage to my upper body and my head. Uh, at that time... I was clearly unconscious, but I fell into the driver's lap and uh, basically lay there dead. Uh, I wasn't moving. I was completely unconscious. He didn't know if I was dead or alive. And uh, I was stuck between my car and his car. So the only option that he had was to pull away. And when he pulled away, I just fell on the ground. And uh, his mindset was completely correct at the time. He said, well, I didn't know whether I should go check on you or not because you weren't moving. There was nothing there. But 
to keep you safe, I went further ahead on the track and flagged people so that they wouldn't come over there and uh, do more damage if that was the case and wait for the safety crew to come over there. Um, so at that time, the the photographer and, and uh, the guy that ran me over or that hit me, they were flagging people out of the way, which was fantastic. They made totally the right decisions and the right calls in every single piece that they did. Uh, a couple guys ended up still running me over though. Um, I had my hands pretty messed up and things like that. Um, but at some point, I think after the last guy ran me over, it woke me up. And uh, when it woke me up, I didn't really know what was going on because I was so injured um, and such a traumatic injury. But from motocross and all those things that I talked about before, it gave me the understanding of whenever you are hurt, you do an inventory of what's going on with your body and you try to do as much as you can immediately so that you can have the best chance of survival. So to put this in a layman's term, if you break your ankle on a dirt bike and you're wearing dirt bike boots, the first thing that you do is you take your boot off because it gives your ankle the best chance of survival when you get to the hospital. So, and that's the way I've always been trained. I'm not a doctor, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the way I've always been taught to deal with injuries. So I did an inventory of myself. I had my gloves on and I couldn't see or I couldn't hear because everything in my head was crushed or not working. All I could do was just like kind of like wobble around. So I grabbed, like I used my gloves and I like felt underneath my helmet and I could feel with my hands that it was wet. And I thought maybe it was like gas or maybe it was oil or maybe it was something from the car. Like I didn't know, right? And then so I tasted it and I was like, shit, that's all blood. Like, this is something that's really wrong now. And again, I was discombobulated. I didn't really understand what was going on. So I knew the next thing was for me to protect myself because I didn't know where I was laying on the track or off the track, wherever I was. So I started using my hands and searching around for stuff. And I kind of like could hear um, like vibrations. So I thought, okay, well, my car must be pretty close. So I started like, basically like kind of like crawling on the, on the ground. I still had my helmet on and I felt my car and I was like, okay, this is the front bumper. I could feel the front bumper. This is the, the roof. And then, so I went over to where the roof was and I protected myself with the car and I was behind the car where the roof was. And I took off my helmet because I knew that if I didn't take it off now, that it would, the swelling would get too bad and it would start pushing my brain up against the, the pads and the padding in the helmet and I might not have a chance of survival. So I needed to at least let it breathe at that point. So I took off my helmet and got it taken off as quickly as possible. I mean, it was like, dude, it was torture. And right as I did that, um, I'll just, he was like my knight in shining armor or my savior, my angel that came. Brett Carpenter, who now works at Polaris, he's the Polaris race team manager. Um, he was working at Rigid Industries at the time. He's never raced a UTV, and all of a sudden he uses a UTV from Mike and Danielle Gardner just to go have fun at the UTV World Championship. He was there for a reason, and the reason was me. He got out of his car and helped me and basically saved my life because he was able to talk to me and keep me coherent until the safety crew got there. And once the safety crew got there, I mean, you can understand what happens after that. They obviously take care of you and do as much as they can. Um, I was transported to, I think it was Bullhead City or something. Um, it was one of the closest places, but they're not a trauma unit. So they had to take me from that hospital uh, to UMC in Las Vegas. And that's a tier one trauma hospital. And uh, at that hospital, unfortunately, I, uh, I lost my life. And, uh, so they, for whatever reason, and we talk about this all the time, nobody understands who's looking over them. Nobody understands fate, all this other crazy stuff, right? Whatever you believe in, it doesn't matter because there's something that is, has your destiny, whatever it is. Right. And my destiny was not to leave. So I don't want to go into all these crazy things because man, I had so many eye-opening experiences and feelings through my body during these crazy times. Like 
if I were to tell you guys, you guys would think I'm a fucking nut job because of all the stuff that I felt. But I ended up staying. I ended up living. And to this day, I still can barely see out of my red eye. I can't control any of my nasal passages. I don't take one bit of medicine ever. Don't take even Tylenol. But every single day when I wake up, it feels like I got hit by a train. But the fact is, I didn't die those days the, during that time. I'm still here. So I have no idea why it is, <laughs> but I'm stoked. Like, I'm so pumped. Like, every day I'm in so much pain and all this other crazy stuff. But it's that whole light that I was talking about earlier, that whole, like, level of stoke on life that I can't get over. It's just insane how good it is for me to be able to go to breakfast with my family on Sundays. Like, that's so meaning. It's so meaningful. There's a, a very few number of people that can actually look back to an event in life that they can identify as a turning point on their perspective and their, and their appreciation for what um, life is in general, let alone who they get to experience that with. Um, you know, I, I, my, my personal life, I, my firstborn boy had a lot of similar type of scenarios where people lost their lives people weren't supposed to be living the way they are. And there's definitely a, a destination for us all. And it's all about how we choose to move forward. And, you know, you've, you've been in a, in a situation where you've been knocked down multiple times and getting through one of those is, is amazing enough as, as it is, right. Getting through it twice and now a third time where it's not just the same thing over and over again. It's literally almost a starting over again thing where you're still having to learn things again, even though you've already been through things similar to it. You're, st you're still having to learn life again, but you now have this, this different appreciation that even you didn't have the first time, that you didn't even have the second time. Like each time you've, you've gained such insight on life in general that um, you're in a very unique position to be a conveyor of hope and to be a conveyor of, of some, somebody that can overcome little obstacles and big obstacles and treat them the same. They're, they're, you're, you're in a place of being held down and you have the ability to move forward and pass them no matter what that is. And it's just a matter of how you approach life and, and if you're willing to choose winning at life versus winning you know, the material things. Man, that's such a good way to put it. That's it's really meaningful to hear that, man. It really is. Uh, thank you for saying winning at life because that's going to tie into a, a little topic that we're <laughs> going to talk about. I hope um, with one of the projects that we're working on. But well, let me ask you guys this question. Maybe you and Ian could both answer this. So, understanding all of that stuff, I still don't know that. Like, I, I don't consider myself like this dude that should be an inspiration or anything like that. Like, I, I give myself pat on the backs, like I told you. Like, I feel like I'm doing a good job, and I want to share my story with everybody. But do you think that, like, going through all of this stuff in the past, hearing some of this story, if I hadn't have gone through that, I would have, I would have actually passed on. Like, maybe I was. I always feel like maybe I was strong enough because of what I've been through in life to not fall by the wayside during this last incident. Yeah, I think that there is definitely um, a route that your life takes that you subconsciously attach yourself to certain people and certain ideals and certain um, abilities to connect with certain groups of people uh, that we're not really aware of but that we do it subconsciously because that's who we are internally. Like our, 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 our consciousness makes those choices for us. And going back to what I was just saying about uh, when my first bo born boy was um, uh, on his way to being born, the doctors, every, t every appointment told us to abort him and to get rid of him. Like he was a useless piece of chunk of flesh that would be useless to the world and a burden on us. And, God, that's horrible. and we chose a different route. We knew in our heart that basically we knew it wasn't a workout, right? And 
seven and a half weeks early uh, from his birthday uh, birth date, uh, the wife went into a condition. Her body shut down, tried to kill the kid. They had to go to the hospital, emergency C-section, all that kind of stuff. What we weren't told was that she died on the operating table. What we weren't oh told God. was that she went through a whole bunch of different things that her white blood cell counts were lower than a full stage chemo patient, like a whole bunch of different scenarios. But we held on to that concept that we felt internally, something that inside of us told us that there was a different destination than what you're being told from the outside community. And what ended up happening is now I have a 13 year old son that is just started back in school. He's very uh, unique and has a great personality. And I have a wa- beautiful wife still here, still living in the same house as me and enjoying life with me. And, um, you know, we, there's definitely a destination for each of us. And I think that subconsciously we put ourselves in a position to succeed or not succeed. And it's all about the mindset that we have going into each day. And if we're choosing that each day, we're going to overcome our hurdles and we're choosing each day that we're going to be, um, the, the overcomers in each of our own little scenarios. Um, if we believe it internally, I think that we're going to show it externally. That makes so much sense. So I think there's definitely, you know, you had a, a unique situation where you had a multiple scenarios all playing out at the same time to, to coincidentally come together at the same moment in time. One being the fact that you're pra- practically half cyborg now. And the other thing being that um, you had people there at the right place at the right time, right? So um, there's definitely, uh, I, I, I can't speak towards if, if you or anyone else believes in like predestined type stuff, but I believe that if we're in, if we're subconsciously believing in a certain destination, we're going to, we're going to make the right choices to get there. So, um, you know, all this leads up in your life to where you're at now. And we've had a couple conversations where, you know, you've said, you know, you don't know if, if, if the feedback is what you're supposed to be going after, or if it's the, the, the overcoming things you're supposed to be going back after or, or whatever. But I think more importantly is the fact that you're just doing the fact that you're still moving towards that direction that you have internally and you're still overcoming because that's the direction that you believe in. It's not the direction. It's not believing in somebody else to tell you what your destination is. It's the fact that you believe that you're in, you're in the operating control room of your own destination. You can make the choices that put you at the goal that you want to succeed at. So as long as you're doing it, you're going to show those that are interested in it, that you can succeed. And then whether they're inspired by that or not, is totally up to their 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 destination plan, right? Their subconscious. So um, I don't think that, you know, with what you've gone through, that you can say that you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing or that you're doing the right intentions here or there. I think it's just a matter of being true to yourself, being true to what you believe and making the best choices for what you're what you're doing so that you end up at that at that end goal. It's really similar to the same decisions. Man, I really needed to hear that. It's very similar to what you did, too. You guys just stayed true to yourself. That makes me feel a lot better, Zach. I appreciate that. So to lighten things up a little bit, we got through that. We, uh, if you followed uh, George on social, you can see that he's he's done things like shoving popsicle sticks in his mouth to stretch his mouth out or all sorts of weird stuff for recovery. But uh, uh, eating tacos has been a regular uh, prescribed diet of uh, encouragement, I think. We even had to blend them up into liquid puree, uh, liquid puree too, man, when I had to <laughs> eat out of a syringe. Hey, however, however it works to get it, get the tacos in. They're, they're like, they're still delicious. So, so just to, to break things up a little bit, what's your favorite uh, taco uh, meat? Oh, what's my favorite taco combo? I'm kind of a traditional taco guy. I like some shredded beef tacos with uh, just some lettuce and cheese and then throw some guacamole and salsa in there and then uh, deep fry those bad boys up. They're called Tacos Dorados. Those are one of my favorites, man. I love those bad boys. How about you guys? I just blacked out as soon as you guys said tacos. So, uh... <laughs> so uh, Ian, you, you do the event circuit quite a bit. Have you ever found an event that actually has good tacos? No, uh, UTV takeover last year in Coos Bay had this, it had some sort of like, there was this avocado, 
avocado chili. It was, I, well, no, it wasn't chili. It was like some sort of keto thing that uh, I, I'm telling you guys. I mean, I could probably recite the date. It was like June 28th last year. <laughs> I mean, it's like my my life changed for the better. Do you have a tattoo um, of that plate of food on your back? <laughs> I don't. I don't. But you know, it's it's just hearing you guys talk about that. You know, I we we I have at my house we have our own challenges as well. I've got an 18 year old boy who's pretty severely autistic and uh, just a, a you know a sweetheart of a kid. And this whole COVID thing is just throwing him for such a loop. You know, he's gained a lot of weight, and, and you know, with autism, you're so routine driven. It's been yeah. such a challenge. And I mean, I'm telling you right now, I've got I've got some pretty amazing women in my life. My wife and I, even my ex wife. You know, this this kid's just got this team around him and. But in, in terms of the stuff that you kind of carry with you, you know, it, it's interesting, like, like on my car, on my YXZ, you would see the number 25 on it on my uh, Can-Am, you'd see the number 25 on it. And it's probably too dark, but you see this little tattoo I got right here. It's a shark. Yeah. And it's got, the, it's it. got the number 20. Yeah. It's got the number 25 on it. And I don't even have to look at the calendar like day after tomorrow. What that tattoo is, is kind of a tribute to, I, I lost one of my best friends when I, when he was 18, he was one of the youngest kids, one of the youngest cases in the United States diagnosed with uh, lung cancer. This is back in 1990. Uh, he was actually diagnosed, I want to say in late 1993. Well, we lost him and day after tomorrow is literally the 25th anniversary of it. And it's just, it, it's unbelievable what kind of, what you carry with you, what propels you, you know. It, it, it's those type of reality things, especially with UTV, you know, UTV, I, I'll be a hundred percent honest with you. There's a lot of times I feel kind of a little bit cynical, you know, you'll see some incidents where you, where you see the industry does a lot because it's an ascending industry. And it's because it's, there's so many companies that are kind of carving out their own niche in this industry and they want to gain market. They want to gain market share that they're, they're working with some people and, you see some people really benefit from that. You see some people kind of take advantage of that. And it, it kind of makes me step back every now and then just make sure that we're doing this stuff for the right reasons. And I think that's where these BDRs come to play. It's where these overland trips come into play because it's just pure stoke. You know, it's just, you're, you're doing, I mean, it's hard to put into perspective. Like I try, I couldn't even begin to tell you how many people in my life I've tried to get out and go do this stuff with and try to inspire them. Just like, Hey, I got a, I got an extra seat right next to me. Get in my car. I will take you somewhere so unbelievable. And everybody just gets caught up with life, with, with the job, with the routine, this, that, and the other. And I, I, I just, I, I'm just thankful, you know, I'm just so thankful, but it's, it's almost like, I hate to get kind of weird about it, but you know, I, I've talked to, a, I've, I've talked to a lot of surfers that kind of have that mentality. Where, and you'll, you'll hear that question a lot. Make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. And, uh, you know, media, media seems, media seems very self-serving. But if you're out there doing the, if you're out there because you love it, promoting it because you love it, trying to inspire people to go out and go do these things, it, it's ridiculously, ridiculously rewarding. I'm not even exaggerating here. Like I, I'm, I think I'm 300 miles from the destination. So I'm, I'm 1300 miles into this trip. There's been like six, seven people, a Burlington Northern truck semis that go around this big ass full throttle trailer, honk their horn, and then just start doing this. Nice. And they, it's just having, having kind of that impact, seeing the impact kind of, it, it, it's really, really rewarding, man. And just like, you know, Zach, I, I knew Zach's story. Um, I think Zach, shared that with me a number of months ago i didn't know the depths of your story and it's just super humbling man it uh when you were describing i'm like man this dude's got an open invite on any any sort of trip that we do so <laughs> it's just like uh, well, I would, I, I'm, I'm 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 pumped i would definitely be stoked to go meet up with you guys and shake your guys' hands that's for sure yeah so that's one of the reasons that uh I think Zach wanted to talk about it, but the project that we have coming up with the Project RS1 is exactly, we're doing it exactly because of the same reasons that you do at your day job. You've, you've been hosting the, the, the Dirt Life podcast here for uh, about a year now um, as kind of a, a, a way of connect, staying connected with the racing community and being a part of, of the discussion and being a part of something that 
is deeper to you than most people, but but it's still a, a big community of people that all are doing the same thing for the same reasons. Uh, and I, I, it seems like you're enjoying what you're doing there. And then um, what happened to, you know, what, what led up to what we're doing now with Product RS1 and then what is our Product RS1? So the, uh, first of all, you're, you're completely right. And you and Ian both hit on a, a good subject is the camaraderie of the UTV industry and understanding how people actually operate. Like when we started this Dirt Life show, I didn't really understand like what it would mean to people. You know, I was just doing it on a whim. Like I was like, okay, well, my job is done. I hurt myself. I can't see, I can't hear, I can't do anything. Like the only thing I can do is talk. Like that's all I can do is talk. And I can barely talk because my jaw's wired shut. Like, I was going to say, you couldn't even I, do that for a long time. Yeah. So like, I'm just sitting there and, and I've got so much anxiety, all of the things that you have when you're going through a situation like this, just like when you were going through a situation with your family, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking like, what the heck am I going to do? So all of a sudden I'm thinking like, well, maybe if I can talk a little bit, I'll start a podcast. No idea whether it would succeed, no idea anything, just figured I'd start it. So for four months, I asked Siri on my iPhone how to start a podcast and she would bring up YouTube videos and I would put the phone right up against the backside of my ear so I could hear it vibrate because there's little bones in the back of your ear that you can hear better with. And I could hear her talking and I could hear these videos playing. So I would listen to these videos for four months and I understood a little bit like with my computer background and you know this Zach because you understand how to operate a computer and you can kind of get yourself through things. You, you do these, uh, really logistical or uh, logical thinking tasks, right? So the audio and all these different things, like I'm not an expert, but I log logistically could put it together. Yep. So I figured it out in my head and I thought, all right, well, I'll figure out a name for it. And then uh, I just thought of growing up in the dirt. So it was like, okay, cool. What are we going to talk about? And, and it's kind of turned into a, a, you know, they kind of grow their own legs, um, but it kind of turned into the racing thing, just like what you guys have known it as. Uh, but I think that's just because me and that's what I'm passionate about. But initially, I just wanted to start it so that we could have a live show on Monday so everybody could call in and say how they did over the weekend. Like, hey, tell me how your weekend was. So you can call in and tell me that you guys just did a BDR and had a good time or you guys went out to the UTV takeover and had a good time, whatever it was, and just explain what you guys did over the weekend because that's where my stoke was, just like Ian said. Dude, so, it's, a, it's a love letter to the industry is what it is. It really is. Yeah. It's yeah. So one, it, one thing that Ian and I both faced everything like just to give you a little background, you know, last fall when Ian and I really connected, like we had met each other in uh, 16 or 17, something like that. Um, like we met for coffee one day and it was literally just us shop talking about the industry and about what we've what we've experienced and how much we just simply love it. And so uh, we decided to start making content that we would want to consume. And I think that's basically what what you're doing over there, right? Is you're just basically saying, this is what I enjoy about my part of the industry. And so that's why it manifests its, you know, growing its own set of legs, right? Is that it, it's that subconscious direction of this is what I enjoy. This is what I'm passionate about. And I have no problem talking for four hours on a podcast like we do um, about anything and re everything related to it. Yeah. And I, to me, like, I, I still, like I told you, Zach, before, I have no idea what I'm doing. I really don't. I'm just doing something that I'm, that I'm passionate about, like what you and Ian just mentioned, like love letter to the industry. I don't even know that I was doing it for the industry. I was kind of just doing it because I thought it was cool to hang out with my buddies and talk about all this stuff. Like for sure. still some of the funnest times that I've had on my show, I think is talking to my co-host about other stuff that we did when we were little, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then, when we say that, the guests did the same thing. And I'm like, yes, these guys are like my best friends because we all did the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, some of the feedback that we've gotten on the show has been more or less like, yeah, it just seems like these guys are a couple honest guys. I mean, like that's better than any, re any review we could possibly get. I mean, like what else would you be going for? You know, confirmation of exactly yeah. what we set out to do. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's so cool. Dude, it's so funny too, because like, uh, uh, Zach and I met for coffee and the term podcast got brought up like really, really quick and fast forward like 30 days or something like that. And we were recording our first episode and it kind of took off 
pretty good within the local community up here in the Northwest. So I get a couple of messages and just like, Hey man, you guys are doing something that I've always thought about doing. What do you need to do? And nice. so funny, like I, I basically literally t- I would tell them like, well, first thing you need to do is find a Zach. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. You need a tech genius, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, this, this led into, um, some exposure essentially and connect and, and reuniting and re and connecting with new contacts within the industry. And then, uh, something happened not too long ago that said, Hey, you know, maybe we should do something, something special here. Yeah. So, uh, one thing that you guys both know is that the industry is small and whether you think people know you, there's a lot of good chance that they do. So, um, you know, I had heard Ian's name brought up a couple of times with full throttle because of the wellers and different things like that. So, there is people that know each other, whether they say it or not. So I was lucky enough to be able to have this newfound platform called the dirt life to be able to invite people to come talk. And it, there was no real pressure or anything. It was just a fun conversation. And the good part about it was, is that I started understanding how open and uh, awesome the side by side community is. So instantly, just like you guys said, you go out to coffee and all of a sudden something happens that's kind of the same thing that happened with me. And, um, I ended up, uh, you know, I knew who Craig Scanlon was, he knew who I was. And if anybody on your show doesn't know who he is, he's the uh, president now of uh, Transamerica Auto Parts. Um, but he was the, uh, vice president of marketing for Polaris. And, uh, now he works with four wheel parts, Polaris, all of them together. Um, but I went up and going on a bicycle ride with him, uh, out near his house in Southern California, because we shared that common interest of road biking. And again, it's kind of those things that go full circle, right? Like you talked about destiny, like how the hell was I supposed to know that all of this stuff was going to come to fruition? Like we're just these dudes in really tight pants wanting to go for a bicycle, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it was a connection. So I was like, all right, man, this dude wants to go ride a bike. It's close to the beach. Hell yeah, let's do it. So um, during, the, during the time when we were there, uh, we didn't talk one thing about business. We talked about life. We talked about how much fun we have. We talked about going riding and side by sides. Um, He did tell me a couple of fun stories about, you know, how the Polaris Razor 800 was released. Um, So that was kind (laughs) of, so that was kind of cool. But it was basically just a nice bike ride. And at the end of the ride or towards the end of the ride, he goes, are you going to race UTV world championship since it got uh, rescheduled from April to whatever, October now. And I go, no, I'll go out there though. I'll, I'll have fun with everybody and we'll just do some video. And we'll, you know, I want to shake everybody's hand. I want to see everybody. Like it'll be meaningful to me to be there um, to really thank the people that helped me. You know, I'm still here because of 90% of what they did to help me. So I just want to go say thank you. He's like, man, that's really cool. But you know, you're going to be all pissed off, right? When I start posting stuff on social media, you're going to want to go race. And I was like, you fucker. Like, I knew you were going to say something like that. Like, <laughs> way, to, way to get me all amped up. And uh, I go, you're probably right. But let's just take this thing one step at a time here. Like, I'm still recovering. Like, on a daily basis, I'm not doing that good. And it, him and I talked about kind of all the same stuff that we talked about here. But he goes, just dude, just take the RS1. It's in my garage. Just it's not getting used. Just go drive that. You'll have fun in that thing. That thing's like super motocrossy. Like it'll be a cool car for you to drive. And I, I still wasn't sold on it. I was just like, you know what? I'm gonna think about my health first. We'll I'll get back to you. So we kind of go back and forth the next couple of weeks, him and I. And finally, he convinced me, or I convinced myself, whatever it was. And I was like, all right, you know what? This will be kind of cool. Like let me do a little bit of research and I'll call a couple of people to see if they think that they want to get involved in the project or if they think it would be cool if I do it. So I called Justin Smith over at shock therapy and I go, um, Hey dude, like Craig said, uh, he wants me to drive this RS one in the UT. And I didn't even have to say the UTV world championship. He's like, no way you're going to love it. Like I didn't even finish my sentence. And he was like, yes, that's perfect. Like you're going to love the RS one George. And I'm like, Oh really? Like, Dang, dude. Okay, fine. And I call a couple of people. And then so they all had the same reaction. Yeah, you're going to love it. You like motocross racing. These RS1s are like a little play car. You can just go rip them. So I was like, okay, maybe this is kind of going to be a fun thing. But I still wasn't quite sold on it yet. And I wanted to do something that was uh, a little bit more meaningful because, again, I thought that five-year goal that I had in in the back of my head when I first started racing, like, I don't want to put a bunch of money into an RS1 to go race it. Like, 
it doesn't make any sense for me to do that. But I do appreciate everybody that's been on a Dirt Life show and has all this, you know, side by side industry is just coming together. And then so I called Justin and I asked him, I said, well, what do you think if we do an entry level race car build with this RS1? He goes, dude, no way. Really? I just finished a live feed a couple weeks ago or a week ago. And we, the, the questions keep coming in. Like we keep getting emails on people wanting to know how they can get an entry level UTV to go racing. Cause all these people want to race UTVs. I'm like, well, perfect. Like, why don't we do a, a you know, a little, I don't know, campaign on it or do you just get it like a video series on it? He goes, perfect. Let's do it. Um, that's the perfect way to, to go about it because Craig already had like long travel in a cage on it. So we didn't have to spend the money to do that. And Justin said, let me make a couple phone calls real quick. And uh, it was awesome to hear what, what he had said. It was like three or four days later, he called me back and he goes, George, I got the most awesome responses from everybody when I told them what we wanted to do. They want you to get back to the world UTV world championship and race. So I got Fox to donate a set of RC2 shocks for the car. I got Evo to donate a tune for it. Jeffrey's performance is going to come flash it. And I was like, man, no way. Like, this is like, okay, well, let me call a couple of my people. And the KMC and EFX tire guys, uh, tire wheel guys came on board. Like, every single phone call it seemed like we made, everybody was just so over the top, like, glad. Like, they weren't even like, wow, you're asking for something. They were like, what can I do to be more involved? Like, how can I do more of this with you guys? Because this is so cool. And it goes back to what you and Ian said. I really don't think that there's videos are out there every day, right? Builds are out there every day. I think that they can really graciously see the level of stoke that we have and what we want to do with these builds. We're so happy to do it. And we want to, to showcase all of this stuff in such an awesome way that they were happy to be a part of it. Like, I, a year ago, if, if I hadn't had this story or anything, and I just asked somebody if they wanted to be a part of a build, they told me to kick rocks. Yep. So when I started hearing these things and people wanting to get on board, the only thing I thought in my head was, George, even if you go out there and you're the worst racer out there and you barely finish the race, it's going to be the most amazing time to go out there and hang out with all of these people in the side-by-side industry because they're so awesome. I think there's definitely a uh, a feeling in the industry that um, there's a few there's a few companies that don't subscribe to this because they're purely about the profits, but most of them um, they want the customer to succeed. Like the customer succeeding is them succeeding. Like there, most of these brands have personal personable people behind them, like the owners, the developers, the everybody that's involved. They all have a passion behind it. It's not like nascar or something where it's like all about the sponsorships it's it's like we enjoy it so much that we want you to enjoy it and when a sponsorship can come on board with something like with what you're doing with the rs1 they're they're not just saying i want my car on the thing that's happening or my part on the car that's doing the thing they're saying we believe in the community we support our community and we want to be there for the community via this mechanism and that's how we're going to show you how much we enjoy being a part of this with you. You couldn't be more right when you say something like that. I'm sure Ian has something to say with that too, but it all started with a bicycle ride about with two guys that are in the industry and one guy trying to be a nice guy, lending his car to another guy, whether it's a guy named Craig Scanlon, who is at the top of the industry or just you and me going on a ride and me saying, yeah, you can use my car because your car broke down. It's the same concept. And it started with that humble offering to go drive a car. I think uh, Ian and I have talked multiple times about this, where as an as a manufacturer of something that is needed in the industry, you're not really interested in only the people that have the most followers. You're not really mo- as a as a sponsorship component of it. You're not only. Re- you're more interested in the people that are authentic and are telling the story that is applicable to the industry, like those that want to actually share and portray what is the industry are going to be the ones that we want to be a part of. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point to make too, because there's a lot of saturation out there. That's just bull. 
So, um, so you're going to be taking this car out to the world championships and, um, you know, you, I think you were talking to, um, uh, these guys about, about taking the car out there, not wanting to just win the race. You had a, a different, a different type of motivation behind it. Kind of what was your concept there? I think earlier I said winning at life is, is that the core concept here? Yeah. So in fact, that's what, that's what came up when Craig and I started talking about it. I said, you know, after I talked with those guys like Justin and a few different people uh, about how fun the RS1 would be, I called Craig and I said, you know, I'm thinking about doing it, but I want to do it under one condition that I'm not expected to win the race. I'm just going to go out there to win at life. And he goes, dude, no way. That's perfect. Like, yeah, let's do it. Like I just come get the car. Tell me when you're going to come. So I messaged him a couple weeks later and I said, Hey, I got some time to come out and uh, pick up the car. <laughs> His message back was, all right, let's go on a bike ride at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> So you have this car uh, in uh, now, and you've gotten in the car into the shock therapy shop. Is that where most of the building's being done at? Yeah. So, um, well, I don't know when this show is going to air, but this the car has already been through a bunch of different phases. But so the only video that's been released was two, actually two videos, because one got released today too. Um, when we dropped the car off at shock therapy for them to put the shocks on and kind of get things tuned up and um, I unloaded off the trailer and went in a little bit of dirt, man. That thing is insane. Good. Um, <laughs> like I couldn't believe it. Uh, I went through a couple like washboard bumps that I on the YX, you would have made me pucker a little bit. And then, uh, I couldn't even feel them. And then I went through, uh, some like a wash and there was like a, I don't know, three foot ledge or something. Uh, and I went off it and I couldn't even feel the landing cause it was so cushy. And so I went towards it to bomb it and i just smacked into it and i could just barely popped over it man it was so i could never have expected that i i went to justin to drop off the side by side again to get the tuning and things like that done on it and uh i told him i go how is this even possible to make a side by side handle like this he goes dude i've been telling you this for so long <laughs> it's kind of like how ian and, went from the yxz to the x3 and and how his world changed once the once that long travel came in yeah, well, we built a, we actually built a, uh, a X3 short course race car, but it still wasn't like it's it's the level of, of shocks or the level of suspension is just so different. Like mm-hmm. in the last couple of years, it's elevated so high. Those RC2 shocks are pretty mind blowing. Um, having all your all your high speed, low speed rebound all on the shock is, is a pretty different game changer from what most people get from the factory. Yeah, exactly. And I was used to that with dirt bikes and obviously the YXZ, but, uh, still, like it's mind blowing and, uh, I'm not trying to just keep promoting Justin because the main thing with Justin is he's just a good dude. He's always had my back and he's just an awesome guy. Um, so whenever we have something, uh, to do together, I just want to pay him back. Um, but yeah, so we've, we've done these builds and we've released a couple videos now on social media and on YouTube. So, um, if you guys are wanting to check it out, you guys totally can on the Dirt Life Show YouTube channel or the Facebook channel, excuse me, and the uh, Instagram channel as well. But um, I really think that the thing that I want to showcase the most, though, is how awesome it is that the side by side industry is coming together. When I go to pick up the car at Shock Therapy or I go to um, drop it off to get the uh, tuning done, or like today I uh, went to pick it up from a guy, his name is Jeff Furrier at upr.com, which is also performance racing. He built me a full seat, seat bracket, uh, excuse me, gave me a Sparco seat, built me a full seat bracket, gave me the most elaborate, like not elaborate, it's simple, but perfect fitting harnesses and everything for the car so that I was completely safe. And this is like race spec level on like, I feel like it's like a formula one spec level of, <laughs> of safety. Like it, when I sit in the seat, it's like, I've never felt a race car feel so good. And this is just a project play car. Like, so the, the level of stoke on me now is super high, but it's because of all of them being so stoked on what we're trying to do. Like, I really want the stuff that we're doing to be able to showcase that because none of this stuff, no product out there is as meaningful as all of these people. These people are doing this. They're taking their own time. They're taking their own time away from work. They're taking their own products. They're taking all of these different things 
and applying them to this little RS1 project for a dude that just wants to go race the UTV World Championship. It's a simple concept, but what they really are trying to do is support a really cool cause. Like you can't ask, but could you see any other industry doing this? I don't know very many that would. Yeah, it's it's hard to uh, translate the uh, the garage camaraderie that comes through the sport to other things. Like there's just I have not yet seen that kind of camaraderie in much anywhere else across any other motorsport. Yeah, I agree with that. How about you, Ian? Yeah, you know, I I often tell people that riding for me is all about going out and doing stuff that gets me pumped and then watching my buddies go out and do stuff that gets me pumped and just keep it simple you know it just i don't know there's so much about going out and riding and stuff that's almost like a well-struck golf ball you know where you just can't wait to tee it right back up and just have that feeling again and that's exactly where i'm at I, i think it's funny that uh just about every other week, Ian comes back with a story about somebody in a different state doing something new on a UTV. And he's just like, dude, we got to do it. We got to get down there and do it. <laughs> um, you know, that's the kind of stuff that we, uh, we live on and, uh, the ability to enable others to do those things uh, via doing it ourselves or, or showing them that they can. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good re- reward out of that. Yeah, I know. And I know you guys, this show is called side by side guys, but uh, Ian, uh, I don't know if Zach would be interested. He could bring his side by side, but, uh, we're going to do some dual sport rides too. Like, uh, we're going to do one across the country. We want to do one in Colorado and Utah and stuff like that. So get your moto boots laced up, son. Yeah. Uh, one of the producers that we work with is a kid named Cam. Uh, well, I call him a kid because I'm ancient, but like, uh, I think he's like 24, uh, Cameron, uh, Hotchkiss from, uh, he lives out in Spokane and, he just picked up within the last couple of months, he kept picked up a KTM 500. And of course he's just throwing the, basically throwing the guilt at me to get something going. Like I've been looking at the Tenere 700. I've been looking at the 790R KTM and all that stuff. And now I don't think it's not, it hasn't crossed my mind. That's for sure. Ian's been all looking right, well, for an excuse keep, to buy I'll a bike. So <laughs> I'll yeah. keep pushing those buttons too. So we can all keep pushing on those. <laughs> yeah. I, I, honestly, the one that, I, that has me looking the most is the 701. I just, I want a little bit of a moto flick ability without having to mess with so much, so many service intervals. <laughs> I don't know, so. man. I, I, I think you could get good, like the 500 EXE or the 450 L like both of those, like, cause the, the 500 EXE is really appealing to me because it's 50, 43 pounds lighter than the 450 L. And yeah. when I've gone on dual sport rides before with uh, like guys with 701s and stuff like that, they have a harder time because those bikes are so freaking heavy. Yeah, I had a 501. I had a 501 Husky and uh, I, I loved it. It was a great bike. As a matter of fact, when I, so my 501 Husky, I would go out and do these adventure rides, these kind of like these overland trips on it. And I was the only bike I was out there. This is actually how I got into side-by-sides was I was the only bike out there. I'm out there ripping. I'm 20 to 30 minutes ahead of them every single time. And I'm, I'm in grizzly country. So anytime I got to pull over and wait, I'm just sitting here doing this, just looking all over my shoulders. And oh. stuff. Where, where, where's the cougar? Where's the moose? Where's the grizzly? And then 30 minutes later, my drunk buddies show up on their freaking Yamaha Vikings and their quads and all this kind of crap. <laughs> and they ha- and they have all my gear. And I'm just going, it, it just came to a head, dude. Like w- we got done with this run and I was just a roach, man. I was just clap. I, I just wore me out for a couple days straight. I get back to the truck like 30 minutes ahead. I, and I'm just like, I'm getting a freaking side by side, dude. I'm, I'm tired of watching. <laughs> I'm tired of watching my buddy sitting next to a Yeti cooler, just, just raking in Bud Lights all day while just having a great time. <laughs> and I'm out here getting my ass kicked. I'm like, I'm over it. <laughs> so, so that's exactly. I wound, exact, up, well, that's I wound exact, up buying a YXZ. And I, yeah, I just, I went, went, went out and got my YXZ <laughs> and literally my Husky, my Husky sat for three months. And, and I'm just like, all right. Well, I ain't going anywhere, so <laughs> just wound up selling it. That's exactly why I told myself I would never go back to the Iron Man, and I learned a good lesson there. Is you can still have both and have fun with both of them, motocross and side by sides. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I, and I never look back either. I'm, I'm telling you, my intentions were. <laughs> I mean, you can probably talk about this when side by sides first came out. What was your prevailing thought coming from moto? It was like, yeah, I mean, those things have their place for guys that can't ride moto. 
Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Well, my first initial thought was they're they're stupid. Like, God, that. <laughs> exactly. And like uh, when I got my YXZ, the intention was okay. It's something that I can kind of enjoy, and it's something that my wife can chase me around. I'm, at the time, I I had the five hundred one, but I also had a I had a four fifty RMZ, and uh, literally those things just parked as soon as I got that thing home, and I started ripping it around our farm. I was like, okay. Okay, I get it. I'm like, this is a blast. Have a look yeah, at the, cap- the capabilities of them when they started getting like evolving and stuff was like, wow, I was totally wrong as a, pr- a prude dirt bike rider. <laughs> well, what it, what, what it was for me is, you know, I would always tell people that were just getting into moto and stuff. I'm like, look, dude, the faster you go, the better it is, the easier it is. And I'm like, you would not believe how forgiving these things are. I'm like, just yep. trust your bike, put your body in the right place and the bike and the bike will figure it out. And, uh, Side by sides, I found out were the same exact thing. <laughs> so. Super cool. So uh, you're going to be going to the World Championships here in October, um, and they're going to yeah, be that, putting out that actually that actually falls on. Correct me if I'm wrong, Zach, and that falls in the same time as Coos Bay UTV Takeover. We we will be at UTV Takeover Coos Bay. Uh, unfortunately, not down south at the World Championships, but um, we'll we'll keep we'll keep checking in with uh, George, and maybe we'll even do a a live stream or something with a Instagram or something connect with you while you're there. Um, yeah, that'd be super fun. Uh, so, uh, you're going to be going down there. You're going to be doing a number of videos, uh, that you guys are already currently working on, uh, leading up to that. So look out for those. Um, and then when you're there, is there anything special happening? Are you guys going to be doing any kind of, um, meet and greets or anything like that while you're there? Um, I don't know if like, I haven't even thought about it cause all this, uh, Rona stuff that's going on. I don't know if we're allowed to do any of that stuff. So, um, I know I've got my video guy coming with me. Um, so Alfonso will be there filming everything. Um, I don't know, man, pretty much we're just keeping it simple. Like, uh, I mean, tomorrow's the start of the, the first day we're going, I got a 4am wake up call tomorrow morning to go testing at uh, geyser loop with the shock therapy guys. So that's the first stage. And, uh, we're going to keep the video stuff rolling. And when we get to the UTV world championship, we're going to film as much as we can. Uh, we also have an Airbnb with a pool and barbecue. So there's probably going to be way too much film of, about <laughs> barbecuing. Um, but uh, I think it's going to be fun, man. There's been a few people that have jumped on board and, and said that they want to come hang out. And I'm honestly, man, I'm, I'm really looking forward to just shaking the people's hands that I haven't seen since the incident or the accident that we had last year. Like, if I just walk away with the UTV world championship by going up and shaking those people's hands, if we don't even see the dirt, if we don't even race, if we all have to go home because of some stupid reason, I would be completely satisfied with that. But we're going to go out there and we're going to give it our all, man. We're going to try to make sure that we finish the race. We're going to try to have some fun with it. We're going to try to um, get some good film. We're just going to have a, a good time, man. A that's, genuine that's good so time. Sick. That's so sick. Yeah, it's a, it's going to be a good time, and and I literally wish I could have the ability to be there at the same time I'm doing other things, so well, I could well, be there to let, cheer, let cheer you just, on. Let me just paint you the picture of what the first of October looks like for me. So UTV takeover right now. I'm not going to say it's being in, it's in, in jeopardy, but Oregon coast is on fire right now, and then you've got the COVID thing going on. So as it sits right now, we're not 100% sure whether or not they're going to green light it. So let's just say it doesn't happen, and (laughs) we're we're actually hoping it does. We've got Trail Hero in Sand Hollow. So if it doesn't happen, i got to drive down to Hurricane Utah. (laughs) And then then we've got the World Championships going off at the same time. It's uh, it's part of my audition for the most interesting man in the world. But, like, (laughs) it's freaking nuts, dude. Like, I'm in the busiest eight-week stretch right now of my entire career. It's it's going crazy. Like, and even the week before takeover, the week before takeover, we have a shoot with Destination Polaris. And we've got – Zach and I are going to be building a pro, an RZR pro with help from – well, with help from a lot of different companies. But uh, one of the the people that we ride with, uh, a guy by the name of Rich Maxey at Octane Toy Box, is going to let us throw that pro up on a rack there and basically bang that thing out in two days. And Dang. it's going to, yeah. And then literally, literally we will wrap that thing up on Friday and it's going to be on the shoot at Mon- on Monday. So it's, it's going to be nuts. N- needless to say, I, I think October is going to fly by. That's pretty crazy though. Like 2020 has thrown so many wrenches in people's mixes, but like you're busier than ever. 
Well, you know, you know, what's kind of interesting, you know, those reality TV shows where guys are doing these builds, like these hyper aggressive builds and stuff, and they have to get it ready for some show or some customer. And, and that's how they're selling you the drama for the episode. Just like, well, we have to get this thing out of here. We have to get this thing done. And you watch it and you're just going, this is so stupid. This is so disingenuous. And here I am living yeah. that right now. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's a trip. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're going to not too not too shortly be at the uh, starting line for you. And uh, uh, I know you're looking forward to it and seeing all your buddies out there. Um, we've already been recording for <laughs> like three hours now. So uh, has it been that long? It's 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 been a while. Um, remember that time? Remember that time the GPS said I'd arrive on scene at like 11? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Ian, the only way that would have been better is if it was in a Chris Farley uh, uh, voice. I know. Yeah, I, don't have, I don't have that invitation <laughs> in my bag. <laughs> um, so uh, real quick, George, uh, hook, any, any last minute shout outs? And then where can we find uh, what you're doing, your podcast, the videos that are coming out, um, how we can follow you through this adventure uh, through World Championships and afterwards? And, and so uh, where can we find your sponsors and where can we find um, what you're doing and follow you through it? Well, first of all, I want to thank you guys for having uh, me on the show and just like letting me, well, long talk for three hours. But it's really cool to see the side by side industry. Like, I don't want to single out one person and say anybody's better. I think everybody in the side by side industry is like minded. And it's just fantastic to see all of these people coming together. Like you and Ian said, I think everybody is being so genuine in their heartfelt, uh, you know, wants to see people get out there and succeed in their rides and their racing and stuff like that. So it's fantastic. Um, if anybody does want to come follow along, they can either follow my personal page. It's at George Hamill, H-A-M-M-E-L. And then uh, the Dirt Life Show, uh, which is at the Dirt Life Show on Instagram. Uh, it has links to all of the stuff. You can go to the dirtlifeshow.com if you want to look at some of the live videos and podcasts and stuff that we've done. But uh, just know that they're not set up to be super professional. They're all just uh, kind of run of the mill, just having fun talking to everybody. Awesome. Well, I can't uh, wait to see the next videos. I just watched the part two at shock therapy uh, before the show uh, when that popped out. And um, yeah, I, uh, I think it's going to be an awesome car for you. I think you're really going to enjoy it once it's all buttoned up and ready to go. And um, that RS one platform is a killer platform for anybody looking to get into racing. Um, you know, 15 grand uh, brand new uh, on the vehicle and then another five, 10 grand on parts and you're ready to go to the races. So uh, pretty awesome little kit. And, uh, I haven't yet heard one person complain about that car. So, uh, you're going to thoroughly enjoy that. I think. Yeah, I, I agree too. Tomorrow is going to be the day. Cause we're going to go testing. Like I said, talk therapy. So tomorrow's the, the first day that you'll see me get out of that car with a big old smile on my face. <laughs> well, make sure to post yeah, a picture I, or a video. Well, I'm, I'm telling you right now, man, I, I know the industry is going to be watching this and there's going to be a lot of people pulling for you. There's going to be a couple dudes in the Pacific Northwest that are going to be as loud as any of them, man. Stay safe out there. Oh, thank you guys very much. So, uh, like he said, you can follow uh, George and the Dirt Life Show uh, on the podcast. You're on iTunes and all those other places, uh, along with a video version on YouTube. You can follow him live every Monday uh, when you do a show. Um it's pretty regularly every Monday. I don't know about when you're going to the race, but um, pretty regularly you have a, a racer or somebody from the industry on the show. It's a live show. You can partake in that, send questions in, things like that. So check that out uh, every Monday at 6 p.m. P uh, Pacific, right? Yep, you got it. And uh, then, uh, yeah, so uh, you can follow us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those different places as well at SideBySideGuys.com. You can follow us on YouTube and get the video version of the podcast. Uh, along with our website, we post the show notes page with all links to everything. So uh, this episode with George, you're, you'll go to the website, go to the podcast page, and you'll find links to his show, to the race series, to all the things that we've mentioned throughout the show. Uh, so if you're curious about anything we've talked about, you'll find the information there. Um, but uh, yeah, great talk. It's been a long episode, but I, I think it was well worth it. Um, and uh, I think think that uh, we're looking forward to an awesome October and uh, we'll talk more uh, around the corner. Yeah, sounds good, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. I would wish that uh, we had more time, but anytime that you guys want to come on the Dirt Life show, you guys are more than welcome to. I really enjoyed this. Appreciate you. Looking forward to it and uh, some tacos. So until the next time, <laughs> peace. Peace.